Thank you. 
Welcome to the stage, the 108th mayor of New York City, Michael R. Bloomberg, the founder of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Thank you, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, welcome to the ninth annual City Lab. I can't wait for next year. We'll have an excuse to do it even bigger and better, but we're going to take everything that we learned from this year and incorporate it in the future. And uh, the incredible performance that we just watched, let's give them another round of applause. I also want to thank Mayor Helsima for welcoming us to her city. Uh, Mayor, given the histories of our two cities, I feel right at home. In fact, uh, while I've been here, I've begun introducing myself as the former mayor of New Amsterdam. Uh, it's great to be back here in person for this event for the first time in three years, and over that time we've weathered COVID-19, shocks to our supply system, spikes to our energy prices, shortages in the labor market, and severe natural disasters worsened by climate change that inexplicably some people don't think is happening. Uh, you just have to look at the television to see things, the real results of climate change. And how anybody can be a denier at this point is just inconceivable. They literally aren't thinking. Uh, just take a look at the floods and the droughts. You take a look at the fires and the melting of the ice. Uh, something is going on out there and our future is in jeopardy. So no matter what you think it's called or what you think it's, how often you think it's going to happen or how severe it's going to be, to run the risk of ending the world is not something that's very smart. And we've just got to do something about it. And you've just got to make sure that everybody understands there are real world consequences to climate change and you can see them right now and it could happen to your city just as much as it could happen to somebody else's. So. Uh, I hate to start out with uh, somber thoughts, but after the floods we've had in Florida and in Pakistan, after the fires we've had in Europe and in Western United States, after the uh, poles at both north and south are melting with the glaciers, there's something going on, folks. So uh, let's uh, stop and think about it and be sure that we push our people. And of course, also make sure that everybody understands the humanitarian and refugee crisis prompted by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I just talked to the mayor of Ukraine five minutes ago. Uh, the Russians are shelling his city and people are dying. And uh, there's, uh, no matter how successful the Ukrainian army has been, uh, the bottom line is there's still a war going on and people are getting killed and it's just gotta stop. City leaders are right in the middle of the challenges we all face and the changes that are taking place in our world. Uh, the challenge you face is to deliver results today while also finding ways to innovate and to invest for the long term. Uh, everybody can say that, but as we all know, it's easier to say it than to do it. Uh, however, it's uh, something that wasn't uh, uh, readily available when I came into office 20 years ago is a global support network. And so you are in better shape to face some of these things. You have better information. You can share strategies and share ideas. Uh, I was elected in New York only seven weeks after the 9-11 attacks. And the challenges that we faced in bringing the city back while also tackling issues that had been ignored for decades, such as our schools that weren't performing our waterfront that was falling apart, our transportation network that wasn't adequate for people to get around and get to work, and even our economy had grown far too dependent on one industry, Wall Street, uh, and we just didn't have a playbook of what to do then. Nobody had tried to face those kind of things together. Uh, there was no easy ways back then for mayors to borrow ideas from one another or to learn from one another, and so over time we decided to send staff members to cities around the world to learn from them 
and that was a unique thing. The press couldn't understand why we would look elsewhere. As in, in fact, one of the things about the press is that they tend to be very isolated to the area that they cover. They tend to come from that area. They can only write about that area. They haven't traveled as well as they should, and they can't put things in perspective of um, if it's done here, maybe the same problem is elsewhere, and that other people have found ways to address that. Uh, I think we have come a long ways from back in uh, the early uh, 2020s that uh, uh, to accept uh, ideas from far away, but we're still not there. Our instincts are always at home, and our whole world is only at home. Can't let that happen. Uh, here in Amsterdam, we learned that biking, for example, wasn't just some Dutch cultural oddity. Uh, it's an integral part of the economy here and in bringing people to shops and small businesses. It keeps things going. Uh, and that's how we may ended up making major investments in bike lanes in New York City and a bike share program because we saw that it worked so well here and in Paris as well. Uh, we learned about bus rapid transit from Bogota, and we brought that to New York City as well, and it speeded up people's ability to get to their place of work and to access uh, the city from homes further out that they could better afford. We also visited Mexico City to learn about uh, innovative poverty programs, and we tested some of those programs in New York, and some worked and some didn't. Uh, that's the nature of innovation. Not every idea is going to be applicable elsewhere or pan out the second time even in the same place. But if you have a 100% success ratio, you're not setting the bar high enough. And uh, I've been uh, giving a lecture uh, to uh, some military people who, uh, in the military, you don't want to have any blemishes in your career path. It'll just be stopped. And if you don't have blemishes, then you didn't innovate. And that's the problem. If you ha show me somebody with a 100% success ratio, I will show you somebody that's not taking enough risk. Uh, the more we learned from the experiences of other cities, the more we realized how powerful it would be for local leaders to have easier access to their colleagues around the world. And so another thing we did over the past decades that our foundation has worked to invest in networks and programs that allow mayors and other local leaders to learn from, with uh, one another, and spread innovative ideas. Uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies will continue to expand our support for that work, uh, including an area that holds a lot of promise using data to build digital networks. And through our City Data Alliance, we're helping mayors across America put data to work for them by developing and deploying digital tools that improve public services. An example would be our innovation teams, or I-teams as we call them, are helping city halls pioneer new digital strategies to engage the public in policy making process. If people get engaged, they are supportive, and if they are left out, they are not. So if you wanna make progress, you just have to make sure that everybody thinks it's if not their idea, but at least they had an input. Um, in fact, right here in Amsterdam, we are helping city officials use technology to engage residents. And from one of its lowest income communities, uh, we found the key in planning decisions about civic spaces, affordable housing, and more was to ask the local people, what do you need, what works, what doesn't? Uh, we are, terror this group, I'd suggest probably nobody here is without a home. Uh, so to ask us to know what it feels like to not have a home to go back to after work or not have a job uh, is something that we've got to ask people and listen to them because we may think we're experts on it, but if we haven't lived it, we are not. Uh, today, whether it's responding to COVID-19 or humanitarian crisis or climate change, Mayors don't walk alone, thankfully. It is now a global network to help them find ideas and insights, uh, and City Lab really does lie at the heart of that. Uh, yesterday, over 40 mayors spent the day sharing ideas and learning from top experts about strategies for bringing people together and back to their urban centers. Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges facing mayors across the world. And so today our foundation is announcing a new investment called the Bloomberg 
in, in initiative for cycling infrastructure to support, yes. Uh, thank you for the applause. I was afraid you were going to ask whether I bicycle to work. Uh, I do not, but I can't give you a good example as to why not. Uh, an enormous number of our employees do. Uh, but more bikes and more bicycle lanes won't solve all the downtown challenges, of course, and we've seen how they can increase economic activity and promote vitality in urban centers while also reducing traffic congestion and air pollution, but at the same time, uh, walking is another ways to do it, and there's some people that just have to take their own automobile, that mass transit hasn't reached them. Uh, but the whole secret to a successful big city is you have the central city for some people that can afford it and have to be very close to work, and then some people that live farther away uh, that provide a lot of the services, we have to make sure that they can get to work in a reasonable period of time at an affordable price. And it's a business model that works as long as you provide that transportation link. Uh, we've seen how we can increase economic activity and promote vitality in urban centers uh, while also reducing congestion and air pollution. Uh, and I think it's only fitting that we made the announcement here in Amsterdam, uh, which inspired so much of our work in New York, and that's truly how uh, they've done the same thing in other cities as well. Fifteen years ago, New York learned from Amsterdam and Bogota and Paris and Mexico City and other cities uh, in other cities, it was considered big news that we were taking ideas from elsewhere. Cities have been very isolated and insular. Uh, you only deal within your city, you only read press that talks about what goes on in your city, and yet every city I know of, uh, there are transportation problems and sanitation problems and crime problems. There are people who want something and don't want to pay for it. Uh, it's exactly the same thing, and so to not learn is just being silly. Uh, cities learning from each other, I'm happy to say, have become more the norm, but still not uh, as much as it needs to be. An awful lot of our citizens just literally don't think beyond their city, and an awful lot of them have never been outside of their city. Uh, I've asked people where the Ukraine is, it dominates the news, and yet most New Yorkers that I talk to just have no idea where it is. In fact, if you gave Americans a map of the world uh, with country borders outlined but no names of the cities, most Americans could not find China. Uh, they certainly couldn't find the Ukraine, uh, and that's not to reflect a bad reflection on New Yorkers. It is just true that most people know their own little world, where they go and what they can see, and if it's further out than that, they just don't have any understanding of it, and they don't think about including it. And that's what you can really bring home to them, that we don't have all the ideas and that other people who speak one of those funny languages that we don't understand and are never going to learn, they have some things that we can bring home right now at relatively low cost or zero cost and use them. And uh, that's the mayor's job, to uh, open their eyes to what's possible and to get started and leave a legacy to the next generation, the next mayor, of uh, things that work and the attitude that we don't know everything, others have good ideas. Um, learning from others, so we've seen the benefits, uh, including uh, some of the biggest and most urgent issues. Uh, during the pandemic, U.S. mayors shared ideas and strategies with each other. When our federal government was in disarray and even denial, uh, the federal governments of this world are no more, uh, no less guilty than cities in terms of reaching out and understanding and thinking that other people have good ideas. Um, and this year, after Russia invaded the Ukraine, these the networks of cities that uh, help mayors respond as uh, refugees have entered neighboring places and cities have been really useful. You're seeing what somebody else did when their borders were crossed by lots of people who don't speak the same language, don't have the same religions or culture or experiences, and how you deal with that. 
And you're going to have to do that more and more, uh, unfortunately, as the world gets uh, uh, more difficult with climate change. Um, the mayors of Warsaw and Riga and uh, Vilnius, uh, Vilnius and many other places uh, have been sharing real-time response to humanitarian crisis, crises, and we've got to bring those techniques back to our cities. And we're so glad that a number of these mayors, including two from the Ukraine, will be sharing stories with us over the next two days. So uh, I would listen very carefully and say, hmm, I never thought about that. Does that apply? Could we do that in our city? I know it's different, but uh, I want to go home and say that I really learned something and I'm willing to try something new. And did you know that they do that on the other side of the world? And people are going to say, wow, that may is really smart. I didn't know that. Well, you could have read uh, The Economist and found out about it. But, uh, and that's another thing I would suggest to all of you. Uh, take a look at what goes on the rest of the world. Read some magazines and the international sections of newspapers. Don't just focus on the local stuff. Uh, what's happening elsewhere is, is germane. It could be, or certainly in many cases, is germane to what you have to do. Um, let me leave you with one last thought. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, who was president of the United States, I guess when I was getting out of college during the Vietnam War, had a thought uh, that uh, I think is very germane to us at a speech in Chicago back in 1966 when I was going to work, I was finished with graduate school. I don't think there's anybody else in the room that uh, is as old as I, but uh, back then we had a civilization as well. And what Lyndon, <laughs> and, what, and we had the same problems incidentally, um, what Lyndon Johnson said, whatever the burdens of the presidency, when, or whenever the burdens of the presidency seem unusually heavy, I always remind myself it could be worse. I could be a mayor. <laughs> now Johnson never, Lyndon Johnson, he never was a mayor. He was in Congress and the Senate and then became vice president and president of the United States when Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, he understood the uh, unique burdens of the job and the importance of the job. And that's why we're all here, because the opportunity that mayors, city leaders, urban innovators and experts who really, uh, really can make a difference in the world. And over the next few days, I hope that you'll hear some new ideas and make new connections, and that you can take them home and adapt them, tweak them, change them, take part of them, or discard them if they don't fit. There's nothing magical about the other people's ideas, but they are just expand the whole universe of options that you have. And uh, more importantly, I hope you leave here with a sense of renewed purpose about the challenges ahead. Uh, so enjoy Amsterdam, uh, but not too much. Uh, we don't want you arrested and having to have the mayor bail you out. And it's not, I asked her before whether she could fix a parking ticket for me, and I did not get a great response. I said, come on, we're bringing all this business. She said, you shouldn't park there. Uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage a bold and pragmatic mayor uh, of a truly great city that has given us a unique opportunity to get together and see what world can be if we do things right. Our host, Mayor Halsima. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Just one second, I have to find my speech. Yes. Thank you, Mayor Bloomberg. Let me first thank you for your uplifting remark by Lyndon Johnson. It really makes me long for the rest of the week and I will send it to our Prime Minister. <laughs> Mayor Bloomberg, esteemed mayors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to welcome you again to the city of Amsterdam. It's a great honor for this city to host the first in-person City Lab since 2019. 
And let me first thank Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Espen Institute for the program which brings together so much expertise on how to improve the lives of our citizens. Mayor Bloomberg, I know I speak for everybody when I say the way you promote progress and innovation has been impressive for the last years and for decades now. I wonder if you recognize the following quote. After the question of keeping world peace, metropolitan planning is probably the most serious single problem faced by man. It's not a remark by Lyndon Johnson, but it was a statement by the World Health Organization in 1964. And it's still true today, I think. That's why we've put the focus in Amsterdam on digital urban planning. Our multidisciplinary team uses digital technology to engage local communities in urban planning. And this is only possible because Bloomberg, again, philanthropi uh, philanthropies selected Amsterdam as a partner in the digital innovation program. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this is really so wonderful. And what makes me even more excited about it is the opportunity to host so many mayors and world-class thinkers and innovators. This is extraordinary, and we should make good use of this great opportunity. Because I think it's time that cities take back the initiative as global actors. I, we all remember 2019. Cities were magnets to people and businesses. We were living in the age of the triumph of the city. And as you all know, especially the Americans amongst us, mayor, mayors were about to rule the world. And still thinking about it. Then came the COVID crisis, which was quickly followed by Putin's unprovoked, unjustified and barbaric invasion of Ukraine. And I think we all think about our colleague and his people in Kiev this morning. Since then, it has become clearer every day that the global order is shifting. COVID and geopolitics have accelerated a process of what is called deglobalization. And to be honest, even before COVID, we saw a backlash against globalization, fueled sometimes by populist and xenophobic campaigns on the one hand, but also, on the other hand, by legitimate and ecological concerns. Unsustainable globalization and unsustainable growth of cities are part of the same problem. Acknowledging the problem associated with globalization does not mean, however, we should embrace the protectionism and nationalism that seems to have gained support in recent years. We must, as Bloomberg knows, act locally and think globally. So it is clear that we have to look for alternative strategies to promote progress and international cooperation. It is wonderful, I didn't see her in person yet, but I know she is here, that the economist Mariana Matsukato, and I hope that she's somewhere here, well, um, will be one of the speakers at this conference. Her concept of the entrepreneurial state is catching on. Contrary to the, co to the popular belief, the state, more than private businesses, has played a crucial role as the indispensable in initial investor in major innovations, such as the internet, pharmaceuticals, and green technology. Professor Matsukato has said, and I quote, if we want growth today to be more innovation driven, more inclusive, and more sustainable, then we need a more active state, not a less active one. 
In addition, Mazzucato argues for a mission-based approach of the economy. And the idea is based on President Kennedy's Apollo project to put a man on the moon. It cost 4% of the US federal budget and took over 400,000 workers, but society reaped the rewards of the huge spillover effects like the development of the first software. Professor Mazzucato uh, en encourages us to take, and I quote again, the same level of boldness and experimentation to the biggest problems of our time. One of these problems is the following. The citizens in almost all of our cities rely heavily on digital platforms owned by big tech fir firms to follow the news, to communicate with friends, or maintain networks or purchase and rent things. They co collect vast amounts of private data, as you all know. Their al algorithms and a toxic mix of commercial and political interests that capture these platforms poses potential threat to democracy. Most of us share ideas and principles concerning the digital world. In 2018, Barcelona, New York City and Amsterdam jointly launched the Citizens Coalition for Digital Rights and already over 50 cities have joined. And now it's time, I would say, to take our ambitions a step further and think like an entrepreneurial state or an entrepreneurial city. I propose to join forces as cities and cooperate with our citizens and tech companies who share our values to create a new public digital space that pro promotes digital sovereignty um, as in the early days of the internet. We in Amsterdam had such an initiative in, uh, in our town and it was called the Digital City. And I think we need a digital city for the 21st century. The users, our citizens, will have their rights and obligations. First and foremost, they will always be the owners of their own data. Rules and regulations must come through a democratic process. It should be a platform to maintain friendships, build networks, do businesses, have free debate, and engage in international collaboration and innovation. The value it creates can be spread more equally among users, all without our data being collected by big companies, without being manipulated by algorithms, without undue surveillance by state agents, either foreign or domestic. Dear guests, dear friends, the Digital Republic can be the moonshot project that inspires the progressive, innovative forces in our cities. Creatives, ethical hackers, digital activists, software engineers. Let's unleash their talents for the common good. Entrepreneurs who want to contribute to a fair digital world, ca but can't get around the mon monopolies of big tech. Let's give them an alternative. Our citizens who are tired of the cynicism, cynicism of international politics. By collaborating on a common mission, let's give them a reason to be hopeful again. In 2025, the city of Amsterdam will be celebrating its 750th birthday. This is what you call old Amsterdam to new Amsterdam. 
And we're going to mark this occasion not only with festivities, but also, I hope, with lasting legacies. We're taking the initiative to build a new digital public space, a new digital city. And our dream is to do this in cooperation with other cities, with innovators and, of course, with Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Aspen Institute. Needless to say, we will be asking Professor Matsukato for advice. I look forward to discussing it further with you. I hope you have a fruitful discussion and magnificent time in Ant Amsterdam. And I won't be searching for your parking tickets. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your attention. Again, everyone, I'm Soraya Sarhadi Nelson. I'm the host of a podcast in Berlin called Common Ground Berlin. A longtime correspondent uh, who has worked for National Public Radio, and I'm very happy to be here with you today and with the mayor to ask her some more questions, a little bit more about her opening remarks. And uh, we're going to start with a topic that I think everybody recognizes is a critical public good, and that is trust. Yes. The problem, of course, is that trust is a huge problem in our society it right is. now, with a lot of uh, public trust being eroded, if you will, in government and in public institutions. What do you see as the main reasons for that? What do you think is causing that? Well, I think there are many reasons for um, the low trust in our society, as uh, Francis Fukuyama once uh, called it. Um, well, maybe I think it's... it's um, if, uh, personally, I think it started in the 80s with um, the rise of new public management and the um, idea of the state being a company and um, calling our citizens customers or clients. Here in, in Holland, we've seen it um, in healthcare, in housing, uh, in many sectors that are uh, traditionally um, a state owned or, or a state um, uh, or, or under, under supervision of the state, they, they were brought to the markets. And I think the, the citizens who are depending on health care or, or, or housing, they were um, uh, treated with distrust. So I think uh, the main reason of a low trust society, as we've seen, uh, as we see here in the Netherlands, but I think in, in, a, in a lot of countries in Western Europe and in the United States, started with the governments um, distrusting its cit citizens, and I think we pay the price. So how do you tackle that mistrust here in Amsterdam? Well, I think we need another steering philosophy in our, um, uh, in our governments. Um, and I think cities or local communities have a very good chance to, um, to, 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 um, to change the atmosphere because we're very nearby our citizens and it differs from the, um, uh, the, the national governments. But I think, um, I think we have to give back um, a lot of uh, responsibility to our citizens and accept them not as clients but as citizens with rights as co-owners of the public atmosphere and not as users or consumers of the public sphere. So we have to start taking our citizens serious and more serious than we do or than we did. What role does the internet play in either building or eroding trust? 
Well, I always have a very ambivalent uh, approach to the, the internet, as I think most of us do, because, well, it, it gave us freedom too. It's not only bad news, and I think still for the people in Russia and other um, uh, uh, people who are suffering from regimes, uh, internet is still a very um, uh, uh, strong force uh, for liberation. Uh, look at look at Iran, uh, Iran at the moment. But there's also the other side of the internet, and it's the commercial domination by uh, big tech companies that really regulate our life. You know, I have twins, they're 18 years old, and their lives are really dominated by social media and the algorithms that are presented to them every day um, uh, uh, from the internet. And it, and it creates their identities, their, their feeling of self, their feeling of their beauty or non-beauty, their, their, the chances they think that they have in life. And I think it's very threatening for youngsters, but I think for all of us. And I think, well, that's what I try to say, we should try to create a real public space, which is something very different from a state-owned uh, space. The Cities for Coalition for Digital Rights, which Amsterdam helped co-found, is obviously involved in sort of helping define the internet and yes. the rights that people have with it. How is it rebuilding public trust? Well, you know, I'm often very surprised. If you walk the streets of Amsterdam or uh, any city, you see that social life is, being is, is, is regulated. We try, although we often fail, to protect the, the vulnerable. Um, we, we, um, uh, we protect the, the social order in the city. We, um, we have our police officers um, uh, acting against uh, violence, acting, acting against the intimidation of women, for instance. And then you go to the public space of the internet and there is no form of organization, which means that very often the, um, uh, the strongest people survive. So I think um, you, you need to organize through regulation or to um, create, um, um, well, um, an order of human rights on the internet also where they are taken serious the the trust for people that their rights are also taken serious in the digital domain well it's interesting that you bring up women and it takes me to my next question which how does rebuilding of trust take on a different form for men and women or for different age groups or for different ethnic groups for that matter I mean, does the messaging have to be different? Do the rights need to be more pronounced for one side than the other? Well, I, I think to me, one of the, um, well, let me, let me say something about Holland and Amsterdam because that is the thing I know the most about. We are traditionally a, a, a society of minorities, uh, political, um, religious minorities, ethnic minorities. And they have lived, although not ever, but they've lived for a long time peacefully together. They coexisted. Our government is built on minorities, on political. We do not have a two-party system. And one of the big problems by, uh, of uh, populism is that the protection of minorities is not taken as serious as we did. And I find it threatening. And I think, for instance, cities really have a duty to protect the minorities actively and give them a chance to emancipate. And it goes for the L LGBTIQ community, for women, for ethnic minorities. And I think we as mayors or our city governments really have a task there. In your opening remarks, you talked about a common digital public space and building that up. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that space will look like and wow. when can we try it out? <laughs> well, I was afraid you would ask this question. <laughs> First, I'm not a technician, <laughs> so um, I, I don't know how to answer that. But I think, uh, I, 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 
as, as I said, it's not a state-owned space. I, it should be a really free space. But I think human rights and some form of uh, government regulation should apply also there. And it's probably, uh, it should be based on international cooperation because the internet will never be a national or a local thing. Even our digital city will not be a strictly local community. But let me say something about the digital space we are um, um, yeah, creating in our city. Um, I think a lot of the, well, the services we have as a government, we transfer them into the digital space, as do many cities, but also make communication between our citizens much more available than it is now. Um, create digital parks or digital libraries or digital cafes uh, where people can meet each other, they can uh, ask questions to one another and they ask, can ask for help. For instance, we already made a digital co uh, city in, COVID, in the COVID period. It was called We Amsterdam. And um, all the uh, voluntary organizations, but all the citizens who had good idea, who just wanted to sing a song uh, for, for the elderly or, or wanted to, to bring bread or do something, um, they, they came together and we Amsterdam and they um, multiplied. But also all the people who were looking for friendship or looking for help also went to We Amsterdam. So it became a digital community and it was visited by thousands and thousands of people. And I think this was just the beginning. So I think we should um, let it grow, and but also do something um, about, well, the kind of behavior that is accepted and not accepted, like in the public domain in our streets. And not by being prudish or, um, or, or, or censor, not at all, uh, but, well, stimulating people to be friendly. <laughs> That's good stimulation indeed. Innovation and technology often go hand in hand, but they can also lead to public mistrust. Yes. For example, Amsterdam's use of sensors in public spaces. It has its proponents, it has its detractors. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little more about that project and what the city is doing to get people to see it as a benefit, as something that creates safety rather than something that's not to be trusted because it's an intrusion. Yes. Well, we are aware that uh, people can see it as an intrusion, so we ha do have to explain a lot about it. But for instance, where we use it is in the inner city here. In, um, well, the mayors know that it's one of, uh, I, I, I met uh, uh, yesterday and last night, they know it's one of my favorite topic um, and, and one of my favorite problems. Um, well, our inner city, and especially the oldest part of town, which is UNESCO, well, you see it here in your beautiful artwork. Um, it is one of our, um, it, it is UNESCO uh, heritage. But in the weekend nights, it is so busy, you can't walk through it. And police or um, uh, ambulance, uh, 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 what is it? The Ambulances? Yeah. Yes, exactly, ambulances. Um, if, if something happens in the inner city, um, they can't get uh, to the people because it's simply too busy. So it's a big uh, hazard. Uh, it's, it's, it creates risks and we are very troubled about it. So we use um, uh, our digital tools to um, censor how many people are there. And if there are too many people, we close up the streets or we make one-way um, uh, streets so it's uh, it still is safe. Um, that's one thing and also we did um, uh, during COVID in the marketplaces where people had to keep uh, uh, their distances. I think it's more intrusive if your police officers are at the marketplace and they tell you you are too close to one another but we had our digital signs that warned people um, when they came too close together. So they knew without being um, uh, arrested or being, uh, being asked to step away by the police. So do you think in the end people are going to look at this as a positive thing more than a negative thing, or do they already? 
Well, I think it's. Al uh, I think people will always be critical about it, and it's also good because there are also risks there for uh, because sometimes it's invisible, you don't see it, and it's it's good to be critical about the things you don't see, but can still uh, be an intrusion in your life. So I like the public debate <laughs> that it's going on about it. Well, that's uh, that's certainly healthy for a democracy. We do need that yeah. public today, uh, debate. Sorry, um, Mayor Halsma, one last question for you, and that is how can cities work together on a global level in order to rebuild public trust? Well, I think uh, Mike Bloomberg said some really good things about it, and it's learning from each other. Um, I'm really inspired if I listen to the mayors from the other cities and cities from Latin America and um, um, uh, Eastern Europe with uh, different traditions, different cultures, but still with the same object in, in local democracy and trust. And I think it's really good to exchange ideas. And I really like this company that uh, the, 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 that's the Bloomberg Philanthropies brought together but I, because I think it helps us. Well, thank you very much for your you're time welcome. today. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you, you're welcome. <laughs>
you can quantify the climate, you can quantify the amount of space. But I, it's, it's really how do you find the values that lie below the surface? So it's walking a city, it's talking to people, it's being a good listener, it's doing research, it's absorbing the DNA, whether that's a city, a place, whether it's an organization, uh, what's its mission, what are, what are its values, and how can the infrastructure of a city, the connections, the public spaces, the urban glue that binds the individual buildings together, or if it's an individual building, how do you, how, how do you establish what, what, what a, so you give physical form to that, and in the process, hopefully, you anticipate change and change for good. I, is there a magic ratio of outside space versus buildings? I know you've worked on, on both outside spaces. I'm an architect by training, by background, and, uh, and I live by the stimulation of designing buildings. But if I had to uh, try to uh, look beyond that, I'd say that in any city, the, uh, the infrastructure, the boulevards, the streets, the alleys, the piazzas, the bridges, the public transport, the stuff underneath the surface, the gateways. So our arrival here in Amsterdam, our experience of the canals, the urban life, the cafes, the terraces, we'll take that away. That's more powerful than any individual building. So we have a lot of mayors here. What should they be thinking about when they think of something new for their city or for their airports? I, I would guess following in a long tradition of master planning because uh, political administrations come and go. So the vision for the future embodied in a master plan reflects the long-termism that, that in a way supersedes the short-term of a political office. But there is absolutely no question, and Mike Bloomberg has said it far more eloquently than I can, I mean, the future is with city mayors. Um, you know, cities are the future. They generate, what, 80% of the wealth uh, of a global economy. They're responsible for 60% of, of, of emissions. And uh, you know, they can make and do make decisions, which, uh, which is faster than a government can do. So it, it's, it was fascinating hearing you say, you know, we didn't, we don't remember when there was cholera, we don't remember some of these epidemics, but they've changed the way we live in cities. What do you think the legacy of COVID will be? Will people, I, is it urban? Is it more working from home? We also have high guys prices. It's difficult to, to I mean, there's so many challenges at the moment for cities. It's difficult to it's see where we end up. It's interesting. In the year before COVID, um, I was approached by a group and we're doing a project which is essentially a third place. It's, um, it's seeking to arrest the decline of a village in rural Switzerland by creating a third place on the basis that people will work from home, they'll work from the office, and there'll be a third place which will combine leisure, family activities, workshops, and bring new life to a declining rural village. And everybody says, that's a result of COVID, isn't it? But it was conceived in advance of, of, of COVID. So um, I think the one change that perhaps it will make is public perception. If I think back, the transformation of Trafalgar Square took consultation with thousands of people, a lot of public debate, probably extended over two or three years. Almost overnight in COVID, you saw in cities across the world you saw the increase in the pedestrian realm. Somehow, cars still kept moving, but outdoor cafes prospered. There was a kind of return to nature. So public opinion, I think, uh, is, is, is one very positive consequence of that. I think there is a genuine appetite to see, to see positive change, to see you know, the quality of life, urban life, improve. 
do you feel like our societies that seem very divided at the moment across the world for a number of reasons? Can building communities at a city level help bridge that? I think the physical infrastructure, the public spaces, can help create the sense of community. Uh, the ideal city is a compact, walkable, pedestrian-friendly, mixed use. Um, and, and many of the... And Amsterdam is just a perfect example of that compact, dense, alive city, which defies all the traditional zoning. I mean, uh, if you think about it, uh, we're drawn to historic centers where everything is mixed up. It, you don't have the residential zone, the cultural zone, the industrial zone. You have, well, for clean industries, you have workshops. It's mixed up with galleries, with restaurants. People live above the shop. Um, that's the very essence of a, of a community. So I think that, um, ag again, the, the, the way in which crises... Th there are all kinds of interesting common denominators. I mean, um, Harkiv approached myself, my foundation, my colleagues um, through the United Nations where I head out the Forum of Mayors um, for a master plan for, for reconstruction. And, um, and in the conversations with the mayor, I reminded him by way of reassurance that, um, that the, the master plan, the Abercrombie plan for Greater London was conceived in the darkest hours of World War II, 1943, two years before the war ended. Um, and, um, and the themes are remarkably similar to the issues we're talking about today, mobility, congestion. Uh, it reinforced the idea of the green belt as a protection around reducing sprawl, concentrating activity. It was about leisure, it was about homes, reconstruction, and, uh, and affordable housing has to be on the lips of everybody who's involved in a city uh, right now. It's, it's so, so those challenges go back uh, historically. And, um, and I think one of the wonderful advantages of this gathering is that cities do learn from each other, and this encourages that process. But how difficult is it to rebuild a city like Kharkiv? Even Kiev, we know today, is being bombed. And so keeping the memory of what a city or a country has lived through, but also looking forward. It's interesting, at uh, one point along the way, the mayor of Kharkiv reminded me about the Reichstag and instanced that as something that would have the imprint of conflicts past and that there should perhaps be the equivalent in Kharkiv. Um, uh, but again, uh, seen optimistically through that mayor, it's about how can the city see this as an opportunity to regenerate itself as a city of the future and the present with an emphasis on science and looking at science and technology in a, in a new neighborhood way. I'm looking at pictures actually of the London office. It's so beautiful. Is it your favorite building? <laughs> what can oh, I okay. say? <laughs> of course. That was a planted question. Um, <laughs> there, there's also, I mean, you made news recently about you know, the, the launch of this new sustainability declaration. Why is it important for architects to think about sustainability, but also maybe to sign something that says, I pledge that I will you know, work against climate change? Well, the United Nations approached me with this, um, uh, it's now called the San Marino Declaration, because it was launched one week ago, last Monday, in, in San Marino. Um, if you distill it down, it's about all the issues which is on the agenda. For, it's about climate neutrality. It's about public space, housing. It's about inclusivity. It's about clean energy. It's about all the good things for the future, about combating climate, uh, global warming, rising sea levels. Um, uh, and it was explained to me that it was wonderfully directed at architects and engineers. My only contribution to this, apart from helping to launch it, was suggesting it should be a wider remit. And that happened in the session. Um, I suggested that it shouldn't just be architects and engineers. It should be everybody who's involved in shaping the environment. It should be city managers when they're procuring they should be asking about the products, the street furniture 
in the cities. Developers, anybody should buy into those principles. And, um, and, and I, 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 I was asked to share some experiences to bring those principles alive. And I showed one or two projects. And towards the end, I said, imagine if all those people who came together, and it took so long with public debates and people were talking about sustainability, explained to me, if everybody had bought into that earlier, that would have made the process so much faster. Uh, it would have been so you know, more enjoyable. I think the other element is that the city of the future has to be more fun. You know, we don't talk about that. I mean, uh, there's um, uh, one thing, a small quote. Um, the in 1871, Chicago was largely destroyed by fire. And Burnham, Daniel Burnham, was commissioned for the plan. Mm -hmm. And that's Chicago as it is now. In the same way that when we see London, it's the London that was born out of World War II. So he said, this is a small quote, mm -hmm. make no little plans, make big plans. Remember that a noble, logical diagram, once recorded, will never die. Let your watchword be order and your beacon beauty. And that's as valid now as it <laughs> was in 1909. Well, on that, Lord Foster, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard for me to say good morning because it's actually not a good morning in Ukraine this morning, as you hear it already. My name is Yulia Tichkivska. I'm executive director of Aspen Institute Kiev. And as I stand here, dozens of missiles continue to rain down on our cities. Zaporizhia, Mykolaiv, Odessa, Kharkiv, Lviv, Ivano-Frankivsk, Kravoyerich, all our cities today being attacked by Russia. We have a mayor of Lviv today, Andriy Sadovy. He should be there, here. He will, he will need to leave today uh, because his city was attacked and he will need to be back and uh, make sure the, their citizens, his citizens, will be uh, secured. Thank you for invitation. Thank you for support. We must believe in our victory. Only victory together. Never give up. Thank you, Ulya. Aspen. Aspen, Aspen Institute Kyiv plays a critical role in this Ukraine's defense, this fight for freedom we have in Ukraine. We have dozens of mayors, our alumni, who are fighting every day. Minister of Defense, Vice Prime Minister, entrepreneurs. Uh, we just recently, our alumni, received a Nobel Prize for Peace uh, for Center for Civil Liberties, and she works years to protect human rights, especially of those people who were captured by Russia last this all years. <laughs> For me, Kyiv is uh, both capital of Ukraine and my home city. Um, I had to leave uh, the city with my three children under six and uh, spend some time elsewhere while I'm certain that we will be back soon home. And my certainty comes from confidence in Ukraine's leadership at all levels, in our president, our government, our armed forces, and our mayor. Typically, mayors in a peacetime, as we discuss here at City Lab, are responsible for ecosystem of cities, which plays critical role for, like in human societies. We talk about sustainable development, environment, we talk about communications, housing, development, security, and many other essential things. 
But our mayor, a true fighter, has had to manage unthinkable responsibilities as a fall of illegal and now provoking full-scale invasion by Russian force on February 24. Today, we have an opportunity to meet with mayor of my city, city of Kyiv, Mr. Vitaly Klitschko, who finished his outstanding career as professional fighter, boxer, to lead the municipality of Kyiv, almost four million of people. We'll, we will learn today from Vitaly that in re, what in real life, now and here matters when such an important city meets us with dominations of unprovoked and aggressive war. Stand with Ukraine. And please see the victim. Thank you. Everyone wants to know and to, to, to feel and to hear from you. How are you personally doing? How your team is doing during these challenging times? And it's already eight months of war. And uh, how are you personally? Uh, personally, for me, uh, for me personally, <laughs> for me personally, it's, uh, uh, listen, it's long, long, long day. Uh, uh, it's work 24-7, no breaks and uh, a lot of challenges and uh, uh, it's actually, uh, I can fix it uh, what happens in which day because uh, every day and thousands and thousands challenges and uh, you immediately have to react for everyone and find a solution and find a decision for for everyone and uh, and you doesn't have a chance for mistake because mistake can be very very uh, painful for uh, for the job for the lives of uh, of people and that's why uh, it's very it's very important to be competent it's very important to be professional it's very uh, important to have good people around you and good team uh, because this mistake can uh, cost uh, a lot and can be painful you like many other ukrainians and uh, many other like leaders uh, in our society had to turn almost overnight from a political leader into a military leader to help defend our city. There are a lot of mayors who likely wonder how they would respond if they, are, if they were in your position. So can you tell us about making the dramatic shift and if your leadership style has had to change significantly? Uh, it's not changed. Uh, for, it's very important uh, we actually uh, prepare for the war. We uh, re uh, receive uh, uh, so many information from different sources. Uh, the Russians prepare for the, for the war, and the chance uh, of this war will be pretty big. And that's why we starting for the war before the war, uh, starting to build uh, civil defense in our hometown. And my brother Vladimir uh, make example to uh, another people and. Uh, uh, officially uh, make uh, uh, very important steps to show to everyone the, 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 the country is very important and uh, responsibility for, for your homeland is also very important. He uh, moved to uh, uh, civil defense and tell to everyone to do it exactly the same. And uh, I want to sell uh, so I want to say the thanks civil defense is thousands and thousands of people who, uh, in, uh, especially in um, February, uh, first of week of the war and uh, in March, uh, was uh, in our hometown uh, uh, ready to defend and uh, ready to fight. Uh, I'm more than sure the Russians have a lot of information how many people, how great motivated there. And uh, if the Russians come to our city, please don't forget the, the battles was just. Uh, um, in the board of the cities, uh, 10 kilometers away from the center of the uh, city, is Bucher, Peng, Gostomel, it's a uh, satellite city of uh, uh, capital of Ukraine. And uh, the Russians have a lot of information. If they come inside the cities, it will be real street battles. And uh, they was. Uh, it's one. It's, uh, I, 
uh, I guess is one of the points uh, where uh, they decide to not to do it, not to attack Kyiv directly, not to uh, come in, uh, in, in the city because it can be very bloody for the Russians. Because we was prepared and they feel how tough uh, Ukrainian want to defend his houses. Absolutely. Uh, I, I know you, what you're talking about, and I'm happy you shared that. As a mayor, it's uh, your job to think about the big picture and day-to-day -day details. And uh, this is something a lot of mayors will have in at City Lab. Uh, they can relate to that. And when you think about the future of our city, uh, I should say like your city, but our city, uh, as I consider it's my city. It's and, our city, so it's, you're right. And, uh, uh, of course, and eventually rebuilding. What are the most important things you are thinking about in both of these categories? Uh, first of all, we have to uh, have priority. First of all, we have to win this war and to kick out all aggressors from our territory. It's our territorial independence, uh, our territorial integrity and independence is the main priority for whole country. And after that, I'm more than sure, success of Ukraine is the best answer for our friends and also the best answer for our enemies. Success of Ukraine, economical, political success and uh, the, uh, uh, to rebuild the city, to rebuild the country. Uh, we show actually for all the Europeans, we uh, we actually part of European society. Uh, we actually European country, geographically, with our mentality, with our history, we European. But very important to make um, uh, European standards of life, uh, European um, uh, rules. Uh, European quality of lives in our hometown, in our country. And uh, if we're talking about rebuilding, it's, uh, it's very important to have an agenda, the Marshall Plan, with uh, clearer steps what we have to be, uh, what we have to do it to be a real part of European family. Uh, I'm talking about reform. I'm talking about uh, rules, I'm talking about, and after that is, is ground, we can build European country. It's uh, great examples for, uh, as Poland do it, a great progress, Poland, uh, the former Soviet bloc, I, I mean Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, they, they make uh, the great job and right now the quality of lives and they is a real part of European family and uh, but uh, just uh, a couple of years ago they was uh, one of the poorest countries in Europe and uh, exactly the same way we Ukrainians have to go. Thank you. Right now at City Lab, you have the attention of hundreds of uh, the city mayors, city leaders from around the world. What is the most important thing you would like them to know about the situation in Kyiv and in Ukraine as a whole, and what they can do to help uh, us to win this war? Uh, I tell to every partner, uh, Ukrainian partner, it's very important, the key for peace uh, instability in Europe to support Ukraine. Strong Ukraine, please don't forget, Ukraine is the uh, largest country in Europe. And stability, economically, political stability, and can bring stability in whole region. Instability can bring instability in uh, whole Europe. And that's why the, everyone interested to strong Ukraine, is to have a good partner. And uh, for us, it's uh, uh, very important uh, never uh, uh, lose the support of our partners. Uh, unity around Ukraine, the key for peace in Europe. And uh, that's why I call to everyone, please support Ukraine. We very appreciate for your help, uh, humanitarian help, uh, economical support, political support, and also defensive weapons. Defensive weapons because we defend our country. We are very thankful for our partners. Please uh, stay with Ukraine. Stay with Ukraine is a key for peace and freedom in, uh, in the whole region. Uh, it's very important and uh, pay attention what happens in Ukraine because 
It will be biggest mistake to think the war for some, uh, some far away in Ukraine. It doesn't touch me personally. It's not. It's wrong. It's wrong opinion. This war can touch everyone. Uh, right now, millions of uh, refugees in Europe. It's disability in Europe. If and please don't forget, we Ukraine have five nuclear plants. Uh, one of them is the Paris. It was on the fire just a couple of weeks ago. It will be explosions. Will be much bigger tragedy than in Chernobyl. Uh, if Russians talking right now uh, to to use uh, nuclear uh, tactical uh, nuclear weapons in this war, this war can touch every man, every woman, every citizens in our planet. Uh, please. It's very important to keep attention. It's very important to support Ukraine. It's very important to stop the war. Uh, and uh, we, and I tell to our partners, please don't forget, we fighting and defending right now not just our homes and our families. We defending you because we have the same uh, rules. We don't want to live in authorities. We don't want to live with this dictator. We don't want back to USSR. We see our future as modern democratic part of European family. It's our goal. And that's why unity is very important. It's the main message to everyone. Please stay with Ukraine. Thank you, Mayor Klitschko, for, your, uh, for our in insightful conversation today. Thank you for your service, for your strength, for your resilience. Um, I do believe that truth and freedom will prevail. Ukraine will win. Ukraine will prevail. And very soon we'll be able to invite all participants to join a city lab in Kyiv or maybe in Yalta. Thank you. Welcome. All, uh, I hope the peace coming uh, very soon. And please, uh, after that, welcome to our one of the beautiful cities in the world, to our hometown where live gas-friendly people. And uh, we'll be very happy to see all friends uh, of Ukraine, all friends of Kyiv. Welcome to our hometown, capital of Ukraine. Have a nice day. Gentlemen, welcome to the City Lab session on Cities in the Age of Protest. My name is Mariana Evanstein. I'm an anchor at Germany's international broadcaster, DW, and I am very honored to be moderating this conversation with two of the world's most dedicated and engaged mayors. Muriel Bowser is the mayor of Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States, and... Yes. <laughs> And Claudia Lopez Hernandez is the mayor of Bogota, Colombia. <laughs> Welcome to both of you. So I think everybody here has noticed that the scale, the intensity of global protests is on the rise. Just looking at a few examples, just from the past couple of years, we had global climate change protests, we've had uh, crowds demonstrating against COVID lockdowns, against vaccine mandates, against mask mandates. We had also people very upset and angry about the economic impact of these COVID lockdowns. We had a global wave of Black Lives Matter activism. We've also seen mass marches around the world against economic and social inequality, against corruption. And of course, right now in the last couple of weeks and today as we speak, we are seeing enormous protests across cities in Iran, triggered by the death of Mahsa Amini in police custody, but really it has morphed into a broader movement of frustration and demand for women's rights and more broadly human rights in Iran. So people are angry, they're frustrated, and they're taking their anger and frustration onto the streets, and it's up to city leaders to manage uh, these kinds of protests. And um, Mayor Lopez, we know, of course, that your country, Colombia, and in particular your city, Bogota, has seen 
wave after wave of protests over the last couple of years ab about a whole range of issues. And unfortunately, many of these uh, demonstrations uh, turned very violent. There were deaths. Um, there were also reports of the police using excessive force, um, in including even using live ammunition on demonstrators. How do you, as a mayor, respond to evidence of police brutality, but also other violence, violence by participators of these protests in your city? Well, first of all, let me say that coming from a country that had a previous civil war for 60 years, I'm absolutely empathetic with Ukrainians. And I think we need to support them as much as they just ask. Now, in my own country, <laughs> let me put this in context, how I react to evidence. I collected the evidence. I presented the evidence to the Attorney General's office. I presented the evidence to the Human Rights Commission of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. I ask the national government, the president of Colombia is the chief top commander of the police. I demanded justice and I demanded change. Uh, that's what I did on behalf of my citizens, particularly the youngsters in my city who were, were rightly protesting and who were abused. Unfortunately, it took time. It took time for us to listen. It took time for us to change, to offer solutions. It's not by policing that we're going to manage social unrest. Social unrest has social causes, and we need to address the deep causes. So my answer as mayor was to put in place and to propose to the city council a social recovery plan to offer more employment for kids, for youngs, and for women who were particularly affected by the pandemic. Second of all, to set up the largest infrastructure plan in the city's history to provide just for families, for income families. Third of all, to provide by first time in Colombia's history, in Bogota's history, a basic income guarantee to forbid, to prevent hunger, basically. No democracy, <laughs> but it takes time. So in the meantime, you're doing this, you're offering this you know, basic income, this uh, job recovery program, but it takes time, it took a year. And in the meantime, people is suffering from hunger and suffering from poverty. And no democracy is feasible under 30% employment and 40% poverty. No democracy can survive to that. So reacting quickly, listening to people, managing as much as you can, keeping alive the small businesses who provide 60% of the jobs of my city. And at the same time, you know, uh, respecting the police, but demanding change on the police officers who abuse their position. So those five things were, you know, the things that I could manage to do. Fortunately enough, after a year, you know, things are better. You know, unemployment have came from 30% to 11%. Uh, poverty has dropped out, boy, 40% now is 28% roughly. Uh, so things are going better, but, and, and, and finally, the protesters were able to change the national scenario, to change the national government peacefully, peacefully, in a democratic, peaceful election mm -hmm. that brought the first leftist change government in Colombia's history. Mm -hmm. So it was hard, but it paid off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mayor Bowser, uh, we've seen in the United States as well uh, intense national debate about how to fix the problem of police brutality while not undermining the role that police play in keeping the public safe. Mm -hmm. And um, all of this juggling, of course, that we need to ensure that civil rights are respected and we also want to make sure that people can exercise their right to demonstrate. And I know that you yourself found yourself caught in the middle of this debate, especially in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests, um, following uh, the police killing of George Floyd. Unfortunately, those protests as well very quickly uh, deteriorated into mayhem. There was looting, there was arson, a lot of property damage. Um, and uh, you eventually were forced to impose curfews and there were lots of arrests made. So. 
how do you strike this very difficult balance between supporting civil rights and also supporting the police department, which you oversee? No, for sure. And uh, what is important is that we are a city uh, that protest is in our DNA. We're the nation's capital. Uh, Americans from all over our country come to Washington, D.C. to protest. So we embrace uh, a protest culture. Uh, it is our First Amendment right to assemble uh, and address our grievances to our federal government. So every day, uh, not just in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, but every day, just about, there's some kind of protest activity in Washington, D.C. Women are coming to Washington, D.C. almost every day to protest the attack on our bodily autonomy that we're undertaking right now. So that is, that is part of, um, of our culture. Now, as mayors, um, we also have to protect the services um, that, that we're responsible for, um, public safety and order that we're responsible for. But as human beings, uh, we also have to feel the hurt and the grief that people around our country felt um, watching this attack on our fellow American um, where he died. Uh, and so uh, what we saw in our city over several days of, of protest, mostly peaceful. Uh, and I'm sure the mayor and others will agree that oftentimes when you have thousands of people coming together hurt and angry uh, and needing a response from their government, uh, there will be some among them who aren't peaceful, but most of them are peaceful. Um, so we take seriously our job, our police department, working with our federal partners in Washington, D.C., to make sure that we can have peaceful protest. Um, but we also have to maintain order. Uh, and that, that, is, uh, that is a delicate balance, but it's one that we can reach. And we had the experience of also um, being a city government that was at odds with the federal government, who I frankly thought was antagonizing the situation, pitting police against Americans uh, and we had to take a stand to say not only are we going to protect our city boundaries, um, our DC values and American values, but somebody has to stand up uh, and speak out against this bully. Uh, and we were able to use our city streets um, not only to, to send a message that we have the right to assemble, we're peacefully assembling, uh, but that we can't have the federal government attacking uh, Americans in the street. So it is a delicate balance, but it is one that is achievable, I think, with a, a lot of planning to give people the, the, uh, the freedom to protest, but not allowing um, small groups within them to, to disrupt. You mentioned planning uh, and <coughs> You know, this, this reminds me of what you said in the wake of the January 6th riots at, at the Capitol where police were completely overwhelmed. Um, you said that that was a clear indicator of failure with security at the Capitol. So when we anticipate that this, this is going to happen again, it's going to happen in the future, how can a city best prepare for protests that we unfortunately have to assume at least part of those protesters will be violent. How does a city prepare? Well, I think um, in the terms of January 6th, and you have to understand our city, that the Capitol building, of course, is a federal enclave that the federal government polices. And the city government will come in to support it. Um, but the federal government, I think, has to take the stance. And we, frankly, I think nobody really believed um, in the federal space that people would try to overturn an election at the Capitol building while it was still taking place. That's the truth. Um, and I, I think that the, the whole um, intelligence infrastructure of the country has to take seriously this, this nationalist, white nationalist movement in our country and be able to defend it. So that's what we saw. Uh, and unfortunately, um, to the mayor's point, uh, we have to step back because it's more than just the planning of uh, showing up in the city. It's 
what are pe what's happening to our institutions back at home related to voting. Uh, we heard uh, the mayor earlier talking about the, the erosion of trust in our institutions and government and elections. And unfortunately, um, we see that happening. Now on the back end for mayors, uh, we're fr quite frankly thinking about uh, our midterm elections coming up, making sure that we are preparing for you know, people from around the country descending on Washington uh, and making sure that we're safe. And Mayor Lopez, how would you prepare then for future protests in Bogota, looking at what has happened in the past to try and prevent the kind of violence and injuries that we've seen? What can you do? Well, as much as Washington is the, the capital of the entire country, also is Bogota. So we are always, you know, used to having people m making their loud voice heard at the national government in the capital city. So that's normal for Bogota. That's normal for Bogota. So instead of, we don't have a local police. Uh, I definitely think we should have. That's one of the reforms that, that I, I expect to, to learn. But most importantly, what Bogota did was to ensemble a team of professional social dialogue, of community managers, of more than 500 people who will go to every single protest, even before they happen, will talk to the organizers, will hurt their demands, will make them hurt to the national institution that they want to be listened to, or to the local institution that they will want to be listened to, will make sure that uh, before, during, and after the protest, there will be some sort of serious dialogue about the deep issues that they want to address. They will be on the streets, working side by side with human rights defenders, you know, taking seriously whatever they notice, whatever they say, whatever denunciations they made. That's what the Bogotas have been done. So we went from having sort of, sort of uh, 150 community organizers and, and social dialogue professionals. We now have almost 800 uh, to attend this previously, during, and after, following up what happens. Because many people came to Bogota and said, look, I did this, this five years ago, and then 10 years ago, and nobody really have solved the problem, and I'm not taking seriously. And that's the deep cause, at least in Colombia, is that people has spoke and spoke and spoke and tell and tell and tell what they need and, and, and come to a meeting and come to another meeting and come to an, and, and nobody actually solved the issue. They are not taken <coughs> seriously and respected. And that's at the end, that lack of respect, right? That lack of listening is at the end the problem. Because I can tell you, when I come to the streets for people who's protesting against the mayor's office, <laughs> Because of poverty, because of hunger, because of unemployment, because of the public works, uh, congest traffic, and so on and so forth. When you come forward, you say respectfully and seriously, look, this is what I can do, this I cannot do. Mm -hmm. Don't expect me to do this. I will explain you why I cannot do that, why I can only do this. May I, well, you have a better idea. Let's, let's try to. When we when you seriously and respectfully say yes and say no, people can understand reasons. In general, people can understand reasons and make agreements. What they cannot tolerate, and they should not, is an unrespectful playing with their own needs and their own expectations. Mm -hmm. And I also think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because national politics more and more globally is in this politics of division, then I will take Mayor Bloomberg's advice two years ago. You are the politics of hope. You in the city, with your citizens, you gotta be the manager of hope. You have no other choice to do it. Hope and deliver and, and collective action. That's what we should master as mayors, I think, beyond public utilities and social services that of course is our mandate but in our current time is, is collective action to take care of the people because only people who are respected and taken care of can take care of our democracies. And only democracies commit to peace or to climate change or to human rights. So that's the order, I think. That's the actual order and social order that people is demanding 
people is not going to agree on unsocial order, unsocial and justice order. They're not going to agree on that. So we better listen to them. Well, you really touch upon the, the big challenge as a city leader. There are certain things that you can influence, and then there are other bigger issues that you have limited uh, influence on. And Mayor, Mayor Bowser, I know that you very recently have been the target of protests about how your city is handling this influx of migrants being bussed in from states like Florida and Texas. Uh, and I mean, that itself is an act of protest by those mm -hmm. governors um, about the federal government's immigration policies, but you know, you cannot be personally responsible for the federal government's immigration policies and all of the consequences that uh, you think. You not. think. Huh? Right. So, <laughs> you, you said yeah. It. Uh -huh. Right. So, <coughs> well, yeah. I mean, this is this is exactly the challenge. So, how do you respond to the protesters in this kind of situation? How do you explain to your residents? that there are limitations about what a local leader can actually change. <coughs> yeah, well, how I say it is mayors are responsible for a lot of things. We're not responsible uh, for federal immigration policy until it lands on our border. Um, and so Washington, D.C. has become like a southern border state. <laughs> Excuse me. And we actually have a very practical response, an emergency response. I've explained it, I think, very clearly to uh, D.C. residents, how I'm going to handle it, and they're standing with me. I think what's been important is that we're acting in accordance with our values and, uh, and we're, we're acting um, with urgency. But I think the mayor is right, and you're right. There are no thing, a lot of things that we can't, um, we can't influence, but we can use our seats um, to talk about our values and promote what they, what they are. I'll give you something that's a little bit more fun um, or pleasant, I should say, in talking about this, um, what we, some protests that we do from our own office. And uh, we have uh, flags, like we have all of the world's flags in a big warehouse. And on Pennsylvania Avenue, sometimes we send a message with those flags. And after the invasion of Ukraine, we put up the beautiful Ukrainian flags along Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, we also have, of course, the, the 50 American states. We're not one of them. We're the nation's capital. We're not a state. We don't have two senators. We're not represented in our, in our own capital. Um, so we created a flag with 51 stars and one for Washington, D.C., and we put that up <laughs> on, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, and I think finally, uh, you mentioned um, what some mayors have gone through, and I know many of my colleagues, we, uh, through this COVID and protest and, you know, fighting our federal government, we're on these text chains just sharing our experience, and many of us have been personally targeted for protest. Um, many of us at our homes and having to have extra security and having all these social media attacks. That's also a part of being in public office and the demonstration of, you know, people can address their grievances, but it puts us in kind of the, the middle of how to uh, not only protect our downtowns and our commercial areas, but how to protect our own family. So it has been an interesting few years <laughs> indeed. And we can be sure that the next years will remain very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Mayor Bowser, Mayor Lopez, thank you so much for the work that you do and for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Fergus O'Sullivan from uh, Bloomberg City Lab. I'm here with uh, Eleni Miravili and Marta Segura, who are the chief heat officers for the cities of Athens and Los Angeles. I hope we're going to be able to be uh, joined by Eugenia Cargbo, who is the chief heat officer of uh, Freetown in Sierra Leone. As you know, we're a little short of time, so let's just get to it. A very fundamental question, why is extreme heat such an important central issue for cities? I'm going to start with you, Marta. 
Well, for Los Angeles and I think many other cities, extreme heat is the primary climate hazard. And so we are now just discovering, because it's been the silent climate hazard, the impact it's had on public health and also on infrastructure. In Los Angeles, we have uh, UCLA created a heat risk map. So we can look 10 years back and create a very strong correlation that's accepted by the public health standards that you have more premature deaths and hospitalizations during heat wave events. So with that kind of data emerging and these uh, assessments, these climate vulnerability assessments that cities are doing like Los Angeles, we can better determine how to um, address extreme heat for cities. And we'll talk a little bit more about all the tools that we're using because data and tools are super important. But basically, it's impacting infrastructure and it's impacting public health to such an extent that we need to focus on extreme heat as our primary climate hazard. I mean, I think still today, very few policymakers and city leaders realize that heat is the number one killer. As, as Marta said, it's a silent killer, but of all extreme weather phenomena, we lose more people from heat today. Um, and heat is growing, and we know that heat is becoming uh, more and more severe. We've been talking about global warming for decades, but we haven't been focusing on cities and heat. So the data says that today there's about uh, 350 cities that are experiencing uh, temperatures above 35 degrees, uh, which is about 200 million people. In a couple of decades, the cities are going to be a thousand that will be dealing with temperatures that our bodies are, are not made for. They're going to be about a thousand, which is like 1.6 billion people. And our cities are really not made for dealing with these temperatures. They're temperatures that our bodies are not made for. And our cities are made from the type of materials that just keep heating, they get hotter, and they become more and more dangerous for the people that live in them. They're death traps right now, our cities, for heat. They're really, they, as Marta said, infrastructure and public health. There are these two issues that we really need to focus because we're losing people and we're losing biodiversity, not just people. So how, how does the role of chief, chief heat officer enable you to do that? What's specific about this role that is really, really well targeted to dealing with those uh, critical circumstances? So because heat affects a lot of different um, functions of a city, you need somebody that can coordinate things. Mm -hmm. So it can talk with the people that work in the health departments all the way to the people that work in you know, um, the infrastructure, mm -hmm. for example, right? And, and can actually move out and find the stakeholders that are the most important stakeholders to bring them into the, into the fold and actually have a plan that's, that's strong enough that can, can get the people more knowledgeable about what's happening, find ways to actually protect them and also find ways to make cities better for mm -hmm. heat. I uh, definitely agree with Eleni, and in addition to that, we're managing a network of plans because we, we are creating a climate vulnerability, vulnerability assessment, the heat action plan, and those have to align with our climate action plan. And the reason they have to align is because they all are addressing the same climate hazards. And in, in LA, for example, extreme heat is our primary climate hazard. So we want all of these departments across the city of Los Angeles to be able to follow a roadmap that maximizes our infrastructure investments, that maximizes and minimizes premature deaths, that improves the lives of everyday people so that LA remains a habitable city. So we're including solutions like bus shelters with shade, hydration stations, not just uh, nature-based solutions, but also shade structures because we need to act quickly. And LA has a 10-year plan to add shade structures, but also shade equity. We did a shade equity study, and we realized that trees were lacking in the, I the neighborhoods you would expect, the low-income neighborhoods that have been historically disinvested. So uh, there is an intentional strategy to ensure that we're creating shade equity in those neighborhoods and all across Los Angeles. So this network of plants is extremely important. We're unsiloing, aligning, maximizing resources, really with a collaborative approach because you get more collaboration with honey than with force. Mm. So, m and my, my approach has always been collaborative. 
I just want to say if Eugenia is not, is she no, joining us? So Eugenia in Freetown, Sierra Leone, is doing a really important work with shading, um, with um, materials that are made from women, areas that are marketplaces that mostly, I mean, it's a w women are very much uh, the population that's affected, again, disproportionately. Uh, by extreme weather phenomena and especially by heat. So Eugenia is really working with, um, uh, from the bottom up with community, with the communities in um, Freetown, Sierra Leone, and also with trees. They have like this one million trees program um, that uh, uh, is, is, is investment to make the Freetown into tree town, as mm. Mayor yeah. Aki Sawyer talks yeah. about. And um, so the other thing that I wanted to add is that it's all of us. There were this group of chief heat officers, which uh, are one or two per continent. We're seven now. And, um, and so we are also talking a lot with each other. We are um, figuring out what we're each of us is doing, what kind of tools we can share, what kind of approaches, what kind of funding we can figure out working with the Arts Rock Resilience yeah. Center to help us with these kinds of things. So. Yeah. There, there's something I want to pick up with from you there because you mentioned um, uh, something very important that this is an environmental issue, but it's also a social issue, mm -hmm. and that it tends to be disadvantaged That's communities. That's right. Yeah. Uh, all all, all Yeah. The most affected. So you mentioned um, in increasing shading in low-income areas. Right. Can you give some other uh, examples of? Um of course. So in in Los Angeles, in California, we're very lucky that we have a tool called the Cal Enviro Screen. And it, it has indicators for social inequities, not just environmental inequities, but it also measures pollution burden. So in Los Angeles, we ju we've actually determined who are the top 10% most pollution burden communities that have social inequity issues. And it correlates really well with lack of open space, lack of uh, new infrastructure, lack of jobs, lack of green jobs for sure. So we wanna make sure that we're aligning actually with President Biden's Justice 40 initiative, which basically states we want cities to invest no less than 40% of your infrastructure dollars into these disadvantaged communities that happen to be pollution burden and environmental justice communities so that we can actually get to a climate plan that works for everyone and that actually saves the planet. We can't continue to invest in targeted neighborhoods that can afford it. We have to have a substantial sustainable funding source to invest in these communities so that we can equalize uh, the health and thriving, the healthy, thriving communities for all of Los Angeles. And we also have, <laughs> thank you. We, we also have a social equity index in Los Angeles that we're going to launch. We're working on the climate vulnerability assessment. I think all cities should do a climate vulnerability assessment. And if extreme heat is not a primary issue, you should actually look at it and assess it to see how it's affecting your infrastructure, how it's affecting your public health. In, in Los Angeles, again, I want to say UCLA's work was able to demonstrate to us that we were really uh, not recognizing that extreme heat when we had these heat waves was affecting these communities. And also the heat waves are now longer in duration, increasing in frequency now from June to mid-November, and then they come back in February and March. So we have a heat season now, not just a summertime where we have some heat waves, and which means that bodies don't recover. Which, which exposes people more to heat injury. That's right. I, I because we're a little bit tight, I, yeah. I, want to, I, I want to go on to, obviously what you're all trying to do is prepare your cities right. for, for these extreme mm -hmm. periods of extreme heat that are only gonna become greater. Right. What does that preparedness look like and what are your criteria for, for being prepared? I'd start with both of you really. But so the way that I, th I kind of figured out how to approach the whole thing is to think of it in three different pillars. And the first pillar is awareness raising. And what we're doing in Athens and in, um, in Athens and Seville and four cities in the States, we're piloting for the first time these, which I think is one of the things that we can do, which is really a game changer, is to categorize heat waves, which is something we haven't done up to now. And categorizing heat waves and naming them can really make a very big difference in how people understand them and understand the how dangerous they are. Because the type of categorizations that we're doing actually brings in the how the risk, the health risk. So it's not just meteorological data. We put in health data or mortality data to make sure that each category actually talks specifically about how dangerous each event will be. Um, but other things can fit under the awareness category. Then we have 
the, the second category in my mind is the preparedness, as you said, which is like how do you make sure that during heat waves you protect the most vulnerable populations? So that's, you know, you have to figure out, as Marta said, where is your vulnerability, where is your vulnerability in the city? Um, as she said, almost in every city in the in in the world, there the neighborhoods and the areas that are the least socioeconomically um, Viable. Viable are the ones that are the ones that are the most uh, vulnerable to to extreme heat on all weather events, all extreme weather phenomena. Yeah. So we really have to focus there, mm -hmm. and um, and make sure that you have like people checking on people, like social the, the the social fabric and how different neighborhoods can actually support each other is probably the most important thing. So you have to make sure that you you you. Um, you feed that kind of capacity in neighborhoods, um, as along with other issues that, uh, you know, apps and uh, early warning systems and a whole series of things like where people can go, maps to facilitate these. I mean, there's a whole slew of things that cities are doing already uh, to make sure that they protect the most vulnerable during heat waves. And the final pillar is that we have to redesign our cities and bring much more nature into them, get rid of cars. And which is a very big, <laughs> <laughs> it's the big fight that the mayors, the mayors have to do. They have to fight with the cars. And, um, and it takes a lot of guts to do it, I know. But, you know, we have to get rid of cars, bring a lot of nature in the cities to lower temperatures and bring water elements to the surface and um, permeable surfaces and different other materials and technologies that can lower surfaces. And the way we build buildings and, and think of energy, like think of mitigation together with adaptation. We, ha we can't keep keeping them separate. We have to put them together. And so buildings, when you do energy upgrades, you have to do thermal upgrades as well, in which is a little bit extra, shading, yeah trees, et cetera, et cetera, and I'll, I'll stop. And so I'll give a couple of examples. Um, one surprise I had, because I, I am LA's climate director as well, and then I was recently designated chief heat officer. What I realized, now that I'm working closely with the emergency management department, is they have the whole emergency operations system in place, but it wasn't revolving around climate and definitely not revolving around extreme heat. So we're shifting the paradigm about how we address these uh, incidents through the emergency response protocol at the city of LA, and that would not have happened had we not had a chief heat officer, because climate and the emergency management department were just not connecting, and now they're connecting at every level, and we're preparing, because we can anticipate a heat wave, and so we were preparing in advance, do we have the fire power, do we have the police power, do we have the uh, public works power, but more than anything, I'm putting public health at the top of the assessment, so we can then allocate the resources to the vulnerable communities that I was mentioning earlier. So that's an example of how being a chief heat officer is different than being a climate director mm -hmm. because we're, we're forced to be in each other's uh, spaces and that's a very good thing, right? And I was gonna talk a little bit more about the urban heat island and the heat dome, but I think we're running out of right, time. Sorry. Yeah, yes. yeah. There's zero but time. I personally could talk all afternoon, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah, no, we've been at zero for, for quite a while, unfortunately. But feel, feel free to reach out to us. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, I think we need to get up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Saraf Ahmed Ali, and I work as the director for arts and culture at the city of Amsterdam. Uh, led by Deputy Mayor Turiya Meliani, and together with the culture team, I work on Amsterdam's effort to strengthen and promote arts and culture of every kind for every Amsterdammer. Here in Amsterdam, we rightly celebrate the great Dutch painters, Van Gogh, Rembrandt, Vermeer, and many more who continue to inspire millions of visitors. But today I want to celebrate the impact of another kind of art, public art, and a woman who has helped bring more of it to our city and others around the world. As a city, we believe strong that every part of Amsterdam deserves beautiful, quality art in public spaces, not just to live in our neighborhoods, 
uh, but also especially to engage our residents. Through an extraordinary recent work at Plein 4545 in the New West area, we've been able to do just that, collaborating with the community and showcasing uh, a part of the city that has tra traditionally been a cultural afterthought. You'll hear more about that project in a moment because we could not have done that without the incredible partnership and support from Bloomberg Philanthropies. And today I'm honored to introduce the CEO, Patty Harris, who leads all of Bloomberg Philanthropies' work around the world. She has championed public art throughout her career as executive director of the New York City Art Commission, as, as first deputy mayor of New York City during the Bloomberg administration, and now through philanthropic initiatives that span the globe. As a young cultural leader myself, I'm inspired by her example. She's been a tremendous force in so many efforts in New York, across the US, and globally to use art to improve people's lives. I want to thank her for her partnership here in Amsterdam and for her leadership on the issues in cities far beyond our canals. So without further ado, Patty Harris. <laughs> introduction and even more for your partnership over so many uh, um, programs and projects and for using the word young I like that especially um, it's great here to be with everyone in person at City Lab being in the room is so much better than being on the zoom and I know but in this room I'm especially excited to see so many people who share our belief in the power of cities to solve problems and improve lives that has always been central to our work at Bloomberg Philanthropies, and it comes directly from Mike Bloomberg's time as mayor of New York, where I was lucky enough to serve alongside of him. There was something else I can see this morning, which I'm sure you've all noticed. The walls throughout the whole hotel, the entire building, are amazing graphics taken from the actual work of public art that ORF mentioned, instilled with Bloomberg Philanthropy support near a marketplace just west of here. This project is a great example of the Asphalt Art Initiative, which helps cities transform streets, sidewalks, and other public spaces through public art. And it couldn't have been done in Amsterdam without our fantastic partners. So ORF, who you just heard from, as well as Mayor Halsima, Deputy Mayor Melciani, and her entire team, the incredible artist, of course, Ken Orr, and the Street Art Museum Amsterdam. Let's all give them a round of applause. <laughs> the Asphalt Art Initiative is one of my favorite programs at Bloomberg Philanthropies. It comes out of our commitment to support public art and strengthen road safety. It's inspiring, it's impactful, it's economical, and it's not hard to do. The ingredients for the project are simple. Paint, pavement, and passion. It doesn't cost millions of dollars or take years of planning. With enough paint in every color, of course, enough pavement or plaza space, and enough passionate city leaders, artists, and community members, we've scaled this program. And to date, we've supported projects in more than 40 cities in the US and in three in Europe. The results have been extraordinary. We've helped make streets and sidewalks brighter, more visible, more full of life, and safer. And in fact, in a study Bloomberg Philanthropies just released, we found that crashes involving pedestrians and cyclists dropped by more than 50% at our asphalt art sites. We've seen safer, average speeds, more cars yielding, yielding to pedestrians, and fewer injuries. We also know that asphalt art and the Asphalt Art Initiative builds valuable relationships between city leaders, artists, and community members engaged in creating each project. As I think everyone in this room knows, strong community bonds fuel progress on city challenges of every kind. So we're excited about the initiative's impact to date and we believe it has the potential to achieve an even greater impact. That's why today we're announcing that we're expanding our program 
to 19 more cities throughout Europe. We're providing each of the winning cities with funding, technical assistance, and best practices training to design and implement their projects, bringing people together, reinvigorating dull streets and sidewalks, and improving public safety. The program will build on our existing partnerships with a number of cities where we already work on initiatives to fight climate change, improve public health, and so many more things. To expand our reach and serve even more cities, we've also made our Asphalt Art Guide freely available online in seven languages. So, with expert guidance and case studies to help others create projects on their own. I hope you'll also check out the Bloomberg Connects app. Everybody has to download it today if you don't have it on your phone, please. Um, this is a guide to more than 110 cultural organizations and counting all across the US, Europe, and globally, including four in Amsterdam. And, very exciting, the app now has all of the asphalt art projects and it's a great way to just see them all in one place. So please don't forget, Bloomberg Connects, download it, and you can also stop by our Bloomberg Connects lounge, which we have in the lobby of the hotel. So, we really believe in this work. We couldn't be more excited to bring the Asphalt Art Initiative to even more cities. Paint, pavement, and passion. I can't wait to see what's next. Really, it's an exciting program, great announcement. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Public art is a hugely important one for our community. Gave people hope, made them feel good. This is actually helpful and useful for pedestrian safety. Encourages the wayfinding, but also gives a really nice background to someone's everyday commute. El haber pintado la plaza, haber intervenido la plaza, puede crear que la plaza sea más acogedora y que sea más agradable venir aquí. Sounds like you got some fans in here. Rep back. Go for it. Go for it. Well, we know that everything dope about America comes from Chicago. See, right? we didn't even, we didn't even have a chance to set up and, inter and introduce you, and you went right to your your point. Um, so we know why you're here to rep Chicago. Uh, this is Dilla Thomas, y'all. Put your hands together. Thank you. For the greatest city in the world, apparently. Um, we are doing this series of city stories at this event, telling a specific story of certain cities through storytellers on the ground. Uh, storytellers like Dilla. Cities are people. People are heavily the stories that we know. That's how we conceive of ourselves, our place in the world. And so who tells those stories matters just as much as what the story is. Let's get a little flavor for Dilla's work. Roll the first clip, please. Chicago urban historian Dilla here. Hey, you should know the very awesome Richard Hunt. Brother Hunt was born September 12, 1935 in the greatest city on earth. He grew up on the south side of Chicago, but he did spend some time in Galesburg, Illinois. 
He graduated from the very dope Inglewood High School, and as a high school senior, he had an exhibit at the Southside Community Arts Center. He received a scholarship to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and when he was a junior there, the New York Museum of Modern Art bought one of his pieces. Brother Hunt joined the Army in 1958, where he was an Army illustrator, and while serving his country, he helped integrate a San Antonio neighborhood. His heroism didn't stop there. He was one of the first people to successfully and peacefully integrate a lunch counter when he did so at the Woolworth lunch counter in 1960. Brother Hunt was the first visual artist to serve on the National Council of the Arts. Brother Hunt is also the first African-American sculptor to be given a retrospective by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. From being featured in Time Magazine to everything in between, Richard Hunt is one of the dopest human beings to ever breathe oxygen. And when you remember his name, also remember that he comes from the south side of Chicago, the greatest city on earth. <laughs> Thank you. It's so it's so hard to hear my own voice when I when I make the videos, I listen to edit, but once it's complete, I never want to hear it again. So I'm sorry if I was cringing, but thank you. You did great. You have the dopest voice of any public historian on TikTok, right. repping the dopest city in the world. Why do you do what you do? Um, in a nutshell, um, I think that Chicago gets a negative narrative in the national media and, and a bit uh, in our own media, right? And I think that a rising tide raises all ships. And so I want to lift up the south and west side of the city of Chicago, and I think that will lift up the city of Chicago in its entirety. Um, and then also, our stories matter, right? I think that we need to do a better job of including everyone in the narrative of storytelling, and then once everyone feels involved and everyone feels uh, indebted to the process and to, and to moving things forward. Involving everybody. Uh, you are a public historian, a neighborhood historian. You're also a public employee. Right? You work for the yeah, utility. Absolutely. Right? Uh, yeah, I work for ComEd. Shout out my boss, Gil Keon. That's a pretty awesome guy. Letting First of me all, come. no one ever says that. Shout out my boss. That's great. No, that's uh, uh, it, it shows. So we, we, I, I'm not going to big him up too much, right? But he's, he's such an amazing guy to, to even allow me to come here. But I'm an area operator, a fancy way of saying a high voltage electrician, right? I work the downtown power grid. Me and about 14 other dudes uh, run the downtown power grid. Yeah. So, yes to that. What does it mean to you? Because I think you're changing many narratives. You're telling a different story of Chicago. You're telling a different story of who tells stories and who tells history, right? You're not coming at this at a professor university lecture hall. You're out in your community. So what drives you to unearth the things that you unearth? Uh, there are intersectionalities of history that connect us, and they uh, tell beautiful stories. And, and once we learn the history of spaces, I, I say it every day on my tour, right? When you learn the history of a space, you can't do anything but respect that space. And once you have respect for something, it'll change your perspective, right? And so that, that, that has a lot to do with, with what drives me every day, with, with why I'm so engaged in, in telling the history of Chicago. I try to be uh, super brief. I love talking about the history of the Italian beef sandwich right if you right uh, th that comes from Chicago thank us very much right and so um, but how do we get that sandwich it comes from a place of discrimination at that particular point the Italians were the last arriving immigrants to the city and so the Italian grannies when they go to the butcher they were getting discriminated against right they wouldn't sell them the t-bone or the stirloin but they'll sell them the rump roast right the, the, the untender part of the meat but what did Italian granny do? She threw it in the slow cooker, and when her husband went to work, she started cooking it, and by the time she came home, he turned it off. And you cook anything for eight hours, it's gonna be tender, right? And like, what's the, what's the cheat? She would use good bread. You don't need like a whole lot of money for good bread, some dough, some flour, right? So she would make amazing bread and cook this meat all day. But what happened, bro, started taking those sandwiches to lunch. And more people wanted them, and more people wanted them. And then it ended up being like a stack of thrown away lunches because everybody wanted the sandwich he was bringing. He quit his job. He started Al Italian's Beef, right? That's a thing that started from a place of discrimination that is now worldwide cuisine, right? Everyone should, from Chicago should be proud of that. But hearing that story should remind Italians that they too felt uh, discrimination and had to push through the same way right now that Mexican Americans and African Americans feel that same discrimination and have to push through as well, right? And that should connect us. And, and if we connect it over an Italian beef sandwich, that's super dope. Super dope. That's the refrain. Um, Y'all, applause is, is deserved, but it's eating into our limited time. Let's roll the second clip, please. 
They say Chicago's a violent town now, but imagine riding home in a lift from O'Hara Airport and all of a sudden an Uber driver pulls on the side of you, pulls out a Tommy gun, and opens fire. That was Chicago in the 1920s. When Chicago and John Hertz helped found the Yellow Cab Company, he had pretty much bribed his way into being the only cab company that could operate in the loop. The brand new Oak Park Checkered Cab Company had a problem with that. In July of 1918, a row of yellow cab cars was parked outside the Sherman Hotel with their windows down, so checkered cab drivers threw stink bombs in them to discourage riders. Yellow Cab Company would go shoot up the Checkered Cab Company's headquarters, and Checkered Cab Company would respond in kind. In August of 1920 alone, 10 cab drivers died. For most of the 1920s, cab drivers in Chicago were doing drive-bys on each other. The taxi wars would rage on for 10 years. After the decade-long war, John Hertz would start another company, the Chicago Way. So uh, raise your hands if you knew that history. But we all know the story today of how deadly, how violent, how uncivilized, how chaotic Chicago is. So you're doing multiple services with this, as far as I can tell, right? You're humanizing, you're creating context, you're showing how history can repeat itself, but how today only certain people get painted with this brush of violence, even though it was literally business as usual to create something as common as a cab ride. Bless you. Given the narrative that most people who don't know anything about Chicago have in their heads, what is your hope for the work that you do in terms of telling a different narrative? It's exactly what you describe, right? Every Monday, no matter where you are in the world, you get the stat that Chicago had 60 shootings over the weekend, 70 shootings, and it's very upsetting to see, right? But there's zero context to it. Uh, Northwestern University and the University of Chicago did a study that said like 92% of the people that get shot in Chicago had a 95% chance of being shot based off of the things that they were living in and the lifestyles, right? And because there's almost 3 million people there, you know what I mean? That that when you look at that number of 70 and then you add on the lifestyle that they were living, uh, that translates to us really being a very safe city, right? And then where did the violence come from? They're emulating somebody, right? The first drive-by in Chicago's history was not a bunch of brothers on the south side. It was uh, Spike O'Donnell being shot at by Al Capone guys on 79th and Ashland, right? He was an Irishman. And so... Uh, these behaviors were taught, right? These behaviors are being, um, you know, like I said, emulated, and they had a starting point. But there were also things that happened that stopped uh, ethnic uh, immigrants to Chicago from participating in that. And each time that uh, African Americans in Chicago saw that pathway to success, something would happen, right? We don't spend en- a num- enough time talking about how Vegas was built off the backs of the black number uh, number runners in Chicago, right? Black Chicagoans invented the lottery. Right, you're going to go play pick three, pick four in the United States. And it was invented by black Chicagoans who, who created policy, right? And so, so just telling that the context of the story in its entirety, like black folks just didn't get to this place. But then beyond that, um, there's more going on than just the violence in the city, right? And so I'm, I'm trying to educate us to that. You're doing a great job. And it's an honor to meet you on this public stage, doing this public work you do for the public. Um, I I see the value of your work, not just for people who are not in Chicago um, or live on a different part of the city, but if you're there too, seeing what you do, taking pride in your street names, understand what real Chicago pizza look like, square cut, right? (laughs) Like I've been deep in this dude's TikTok uh, and you're going beyond TikTok. You have Chicago Mahogany Tours. People should book uh, and support what Six Figure Dilla Thomas is doing. Thank you so much, bro. Thank you. All right. To the dopest historian. Thank you. That concludes this morning's programming in this room, but please make your way to the breakouts as they will start promptly in just a few minutes.
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. My name is Amna Navaz. I'm the chief correspondent with the PBS NewsHour. I'm in town from Washington, D.C. Delighted to be here to, thank you, um, to lead this very, very important conversation that's called When the War is Next Door. I have with me here three incredible leaders, mayors of their cities in Eastern Europe, who are all negotiating an incredibly complex set of factors, domestic and international, as Russia's war in Ukraine rolls on, and I think made all the more uh, underscored, I think, by the events of today. It shows just how important their leadership is in this moment. I'll do quick introductions and jump right into the conversation. With me here is Martin Stakis, the mayor of Riga, Latvia. Welcome. Thank you. Also with us is Aleksandra Dulkiewicz, mayor of Gdansk, Hello. Poland. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. And Remigius Szymasius, mayor of Vilnius, Lithuania. So let's jump right in. I want to know about the impact you have seen of the war in your cities. Mayor Dulkiewicz, I'll begin with you. We know millions of people from Ukraine have fled to Poland. How has that shown up in your city? How are you navigating that? First of all, I think that we cannot really be silent, especially today. This is not only so that this is 229th day of the Russian aggression to Ukraine, and we are getting used to it. We are really here as an international community, not only supporting them being here, but also sending weapons to Ukraine. We can really see it very clearly that half of the missiles were shut down, only thanks to the international help with sending weapons. And this is really important message we should send to our governments, to all influential people in our country. So, of course, Poland was really flooded with people and refugees um, since all those almost more than half a year already. The situation is changing every single day because quite a lot of people were really coming back to Ukraine because they really didn't want to leave their country. They were only escaped because of the war. And today, when I was saying goodbye to Henri Sadov, who was here in the morning, his son is here already in the first row, uh, coming back to his city to be with his citizens. We all need to remember that this help we are having in our country, both Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and uh, Slovakia, and other countries, also Poland, is really helping those brave, brave people to fight for the values we, I believe, strongly believe here in this room, and not only in this room. So this, that we are taking care of the women or children, uh, helping them be in a safe place, is really letting them to be that and fighting for the values. Madam Mayor, your city has grown multifold, right, with the arrival. I mean, most people who've come have gone to cities. Are you able to support them? We are doing what we can, thanks to non-governmental organizations, thanks to activists, thanks to local business, thanks to also solidarity from other European cities. My city was donated from Rotterdam, from Lipsk, from Brema, other cities, so it's friendship again. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are doing what we can. For example, in Polish schools in my city, uh, we have around 8% of students who are from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So it's almost 10%. So this is real issue to tackle, especially language issue, but also mental. Today we have mental health day all over the world, and this is also very important to support them. Mayor Shemashis, I know Lithuania has provided robust services for Ukrainians who are arriving there. Tell us about that, and are you seeing support among the residents of your city to continue providing those resources? I think, first of all, we have to understand what kind of people are arriving. Uh, actually, during the first week, people were electing to come to Lithuania because they thought that Ukraine will fail and we will be the next. In two weeks, the situation completely changed, and we have to thank Ukrainians for fighting so brave for Western values. Now, what we have, almost all men who were like, immigrants to Lithuania before they left for Ukraine to fight. So first of all, we had a wave of Ukrainians leaving Lithuania to fight, Lithuania to, to fight in Ukraine. Then we have a wave of people arriving, mostly women and children, and 40% uh, are children. And for those who are grown-ups, uh, more than half of them, they are in labor market, actively working. 
It's a typical view if you go to supermarket in Lithuania, you will hear always announcement that, you know, sorry, not all our employees do speak Lithuanian because we have war refugees. Please be patient. We address other people and in the hospitality business everywhere is working. I mean, we are glad to have it. I know it in Latvia and Estonia is the same, I, I guess in, in, in Poland as well. People may work from the second day of arrival. And we were employing people even in our municipality services since the first week in schools or in social services. So in fact, there is no problem concerning refugees. There are other problems, how to solve Ukraine. And this is the, the most important issue because for refugees, I was asked a long time ago, even before invasion, so are you ready? So of course we are ready. They were asking me about numbers and they never said the numbers because it's clear that, you know, as many as necessary. It depends on what conditions and actually what Polish cities are doing, that's the most biggest wave coming to them, but all of us, we are ready to do this. And this, this is not an issue what Western countries tend to remind themselves about uh, refugees from Syria and other, uh, other countries. This is a completely different situation. Mayor Stockitz, what about your situation there? I know Riga received some 16,000 people arriving mm -hmm. from Ukraine, mm -hmm. and we know there was a policy change, right? You'd originally set up a reception center, but you recently announced over the summer you wouldn't be able to receive any more refugees. Help us understand your decision making. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think we have to say loud and clear. Russia is a terrorist state. They're worse than ISIS. They launched today 75 missiles against the cities where the innocent people are living. And while we are now talking about how to improve the public space, they are destroying public space. They just today destroyed the kinder playground and the pedestrian bridge. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And, uh, and uh, that's how we consider. We should all uh, uh, countries who are sitting here have to admit that they are a uh, terrorist state. Well, our uh, government wasn't ready for this situation. And uh, the story of Riga is a story about the initiative and the leadership. Because we came to the government by saying, well, we have to do something. Uh, there's people, a number of refugees in a country, and there's no refugee center at all. Uh, and we said, okay, let us do that, do that job. And uh, we made a refugee center, the first one. Uh, and then after two weeks, we understood that it's not enough. We have to make a bigger one. We made another one uh, and it still uh, works and works very well. And when the United, N United Nations Commission came to Riga, they announced that this is one of the best refugee centers they have seen. Uh, seven governmental and five uh, municipal organizations working in one, under one roof. Idea is one stop agency. You come in with your suitcases and you come back, you know where your kids are going to go to the schools, where you're going to work, and so on, so on. And yes, uh, the cooperation between the government and municipality was not always on the, the best level. And sometimes we even said, okay, it's enough, uh, because our municipality is doing everything, but other municipalities actually are just waiting, and uh, we do have to do something, because all the cities should uh, pay this uh, responsibility. So there was many times, but still Riga is open for refugees every day, uh, 50 to 60 refugees come to Riga and stays in Riga. We're organizing the labor markets every Monday where refugees and uh, our uh, companies can find employees and start to work. So because they do understand now that they stay, will stay for long term. They will not come back uh, in, in, uh, in the nearest future. So, uh, so this is a new situation and we have learned a lot. And I think this refugee center will work for a long time because this was very valuable experience for all of us. Uh, and also, as I said, we as a city are quite open to immigration and to the new businesses. And I think this refugee center in the future will help us also to achieve other, uh, other targets. I just want to clarify one issue. We could talk a lot about the national level and policy, but did you receive any support from your national government to set these resources up or were you sort of left to your own devices? Well, what we did, obviously, of course, and because uh, for the only municipality, it's too expensive. Uh, it's about three, four million in, in months uh, in, in some show social uh, payments. And, and uh, uh, but uh, the, the problem is that it's, it's like an army. When you took initiative, you are punished for that. Uh, so and that's what we did. <laughs> and sometimes we get punished. But uh, it's, it's, it's that's OK, because uh, as far as the refugees are a safe place and they are happy, we are happy. Well, we don't mind. Mayor Julki Pitcher, are you also viewing this now as a long-term solution, no longer short-term relief? Definitely long-term solution, but it really depends on, our, on all of us and the international community how long this war will last. This is really our job, really, to support, uh, to make everything, to make this war um, stop as soon as possible. 
of course, some people are saying, uh, those Ukrainians who mm, came to our city, that they are moving somewhere else. They are, you know, when they enter, enter European Union, they can move wherever they, they, they wish, where, wherever they can. Some, they really want to stay and have new life uh, in our city. Uh, but some of them are really dreaming of this uh, coming back home as quick as possible. So there are, in my opinion, one third, one third, one third. Yeah. Mayor Shamashis, I think if the events of today show us anything, it's that the war isn't likely to end anytime soon. You're likely to receive more people. All three of you are. I'm, I'm curious if you worry that the support you see among Lithuanians to continue providing monthly allowances and medical services and a job portal and like all the things you're providing are you worried that will wane the longer this goes on uh, i'm sure it, it will remain i mean i see no sign of support getting smaller of course when people are donating i mean lithuania was a country of like three million people who donated crowdfunded for bayraktar which costs more than five million euros in three days I mean, this, and this support for, for, for military is, is a little bit declining because, again, it's not uh, uh, kind of uh, unlimited resources in, in people's pocket, but support for refugees is, 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 is very, very, very big. But I think, again, when having these challenges because winter is coming and energy resources, all these issues, and the shelling is continued in Ukraine and people are move, moving, moving to some safer place, either to Western Ukraine, to Lviv, or to other countries, of course we have to address it. And there are two ways to address it. One is to prepare to, to accept refugees, and another way is to ensure as safe as possible, as convenient as possible conditions for living. And you know, actually sometimes it's very important to listen to what people are asking. Uh, I, I was uh, in Kyiv for like two days and one day before, before the attack. Then the mayor Vitaly Klitschko says, you know, one thing we ask you to do to be uh, like in this information campaign to, 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 to raise awareness, which is not the like, issue anymore. Actually, I have some pictures from Vilnius with, with this like inviting Putin, if, if you will show, inviting Putin to Hague and so on. And, and, and with, with all these nice, 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 um, nice um, uh, kind of initiatives uh, which allowed others to know about it because people were asking, you are so close to Russia, why are you so bold? We are so bold because we are so close to Russia. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the answer. And there's yeah, the picture. Yeah, this, now this maybe you like can tell us what we're seeing there. Yeah, it's, uh, one is about like municipality building about inviting Putin to Hague, and then we change the traffic, mm -hmm. traffic signs. And for first, of <laughs> to, to, to inform all the truck drivers from Belarus that unfortunately Minsk is occupied by Kremlin now, and that and then we have like Ukrainian hero street and, and uh, on the, uh, the street where the Russian embassy is. So all, the, all these signs allowed us to speak about these issues, actually exactly what Vitaly was asking for. But now what they're asking for is actually asking to, to help people to stay in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And actually glass sheets, plastic sheets and plastic rolls to cover windows when they are shelled, not necessarily in Kyiv, but maybe in Kyiv, unfortunately what we see today is an essential thing. And actually that's what we are doing now. But after it, I think it will be a huge task to help rebuild Ukraine better than it was before. I think this is very important. Not as it was before, but better as it was before. And our help will be very much needed, uh, as, as, at least as, as I understand what talking to Ukrainian friends. I do want to put to you a question that you probably uh, have come up before, but the longer the war goes on, it, it's forced this new question, which is as, as Russians themselves are fleeing Russia with Putin's mobilization and thousands of people now leaving the nation. I, I wonder if any of you have had time to give thought to the idea of whether or not European cities should be offering shelter to Russians who are fleeing mobilization. You know, I, I would like to say one remark, you know, uh, I'm very disappointed about German situation right now because not about Russians, but about Ukrainians. Because when I hear German cities saying that, yes, we are welcoming uh, Ukrainian IT developers because it's a boost for our economy, uh, come on. I mean, it's, it's, it's so unfair because this is not the right timing to do this, and it's not the right timing to invite Russian programmers or everyone. It's just other things which are on the top of the agenda. So, so for us, it, we have, of course, big discussion whom to allow and whom not because collective responsibility is a fact, but also not a fact. So how to deal with this, this is an issue. But again, there are very simple de decisions. First of all, mm -hmm. help first, and then using the abilities of those people second. Do either of you have a view on that you'd like to share? Well, all the Baltic states and Poland has closed the borders. 
and uh, we are pretty sure those people are not fleeing, the, they are not against the war, they are against the mobilization. It's not the same. Uh, and uh, first of all, they have to be against the war and against the Putin regime. And uh, if they say how dangerous it is to be on the streets in Moscow, look in Iran, uh, those women are on the streets and they do not afraid. So, so we think that we, she, uh, we have to keep the borders closed uh, and we will do it. Uh, and not only we, I know it's Finland doing the same and uh, we see the other uh, countries are joining the same policy. Anything you'd like to add? The biggest city, uh, the closest to my city, city of Gdansk is Kaliningrad. It's only 150 kilometers, mm, but the border is closed. And really people who were against Putin really escaped uh, fr uh, from yeah, Russia in 2014, 2015. And they were really helping Ukrainian refugees in my city, mm -hmm. yeah. working as a translators and real supporters. And nowadays they're really escaping with their because they're afraid of their own life. You've spoken a bit about rebuilding efforts and how important they are ahead. Uh, mayor Stakas, I want to ask you about it because you have joined with the mayor of Kyiv and President Zelensky and other leaders basically to make a pledge to work together to support sustainable rebuilding. So just from a practical standpoint, what does that look like from Riga? Yeah, that's why we used to, uh, uh, there was a plan to meet Madame uh, Huzel von der Leyen, the president of your commission, because we think that uh, it should be uh, there should be leadership from the European Union, but the cities must be the ones who do the job. And that's also the message from uh, uh, Mr. Zelensky. He said, we don't ask you the money. We ask you your uh, leadership, your knowledge, your companies. You know how to build the kindergartens, you know how to build the hospitals, better than governments do. So come t and uh, take responsibility for one city and do it your own. I do afraid if those funds uh, or this program will run through the governments, we will lose the time. And this is my message to Madame von der Ursula. I don't know, we will uh, host us uh, on you know, Thursday, Thursday, hopefully. Hopefully, <laughs> and Alexander is also coming, so we will try to persuade her. Mayor Zlukovic, you've talked about the importance of the intercity partnerships. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm a member also of the European uh, Committee of the Regions and head of working group on Ukraine. So there are more really mayors, local leaders, regional leaders who really want to share the experiences, just like we do here during City Lab. So this is something what we definitely need to do to help uh, rebuild Ukraine. And w for example, my city has partner city, which is Mariupol. And this is something really, um, hopefully, one day Mariupol will be again Ukrainian. Now we don't know it. But we really need to think again how to rebuild those cities in a sustainable way, a better way, just like Mar 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 Marius had said. Mayor Shamashis, I'll give you the last word here. You showed us those public signs of solidarity you've been making. Why are those so important, especially at this moment in the war? Attention. I, I think at this moment it's not so important as it was like six months ago, because back then journalists were approaching me from Ireland, Spain, Japan, United States, asking with these questions about why you're so bold. Then it was important to show it. Now it's clear to all the civilized world who is who. And it's clear that we need to support Ukraine. Now it's a term the time for more practical steps and also for preparation of rebuilding. And again, when speaking about rebuilding, again, Ukraine is uh, terribly destroyed during World War II and now. And I think Ukraine deserves a better country, better urban structures, better building and better inspiring inspiring rebuilding. It's not like reconstructing what it was before. And in this case, I think we have to help to help to believe Ukrainians to believe that they can have even better country than they had before. So uh, I think it's a very realistic task, difficult but realistic. All we need is solidarity. Yeah. Grateful for your leadership, <laughs> grateful to all of you for being here. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Welcome to the bottom of the sea. Um, I'm a photographer, I'm a documentary maker, um, and I will take you on a short journey around the world uh, where I've been exploring 
the consequences of the rising sea level for the last 10 years. Um, I was born in 1963, which was uh, 10 years after this. For anyone who's not Dutch, this is called, the, the title is The Disaster. And it happened in 1953, and it was our big flooding disaster uh, where 1,900 people died. Um, the Dutch acted. They started to uh, make their dikes higher. We closed off the sea arms. Um, and since then, we feel safe and sound behind our dikes and dunes, although we are below sea level. Um, I knew, I heard about that, uh, that the sea level was rising 10 years ago. Um, and that, that this would be probably a, uh, a problem for the next few generations. But I did arrive on another project. I arrived in Cunayala, which are beautiful islands in the Caribbean side of Panama. And people told me that they were being evacuated. And I said, why are you being evacuated? And they said, the sea is coming. And I was like, what do you mean? This? So I was a little naive. And they said, you know, the sea level is rising. So. People from the first four islands were, 10 years ago, they were supposed to be evacuated. I went back and unfortunately, they're still on the islands, but it made me realize that this is not a problem of tomorrow, but this is really a problem of today already. So that was the start of my big exploration to different coastal regions, different, uh, different parts of the world, um, which started actually in Greenland, um, because until recently, it was actually the uh, the heating of the oceans, which was creating the, the rise of the sea level. Today, it's uh, taken over by the melting of the ice sheets. Greenland, there's a lot of ice. If it all would melt, uh, the sea level would rise seven meters. Antarctica, though, if that would melt, um, it would rise 86 meters. Don't worry, it's not going to happen in our lifetime. But uh, still, I mean, we see, we see the consequence uh, already today. And this, for me, this was really to try to see what, what's happening and to show also that, that there's a real urgency where we need to act. Um, the climate crisis, uh, it doesn't take into account if you're rich or poor. So it will, it, it's happening in all coastal regions. Um, so the next, uh, next chapter was Bangladesh. And, in Bangladesh, which has uh, one of the most densely populated countries in the world, uh, 160 million people, of which 50 million people um, live in the delta, I start to understand that you don't have to wait for the water to actually come into your house permanently, but it starts already when the land becomes saline, people can't grow crops anymore, there's no safe drinking water. So 50 million people just in the delta, and many of them are moving as well. I must say that for Bangladesh was one of the places where people understand very well what's happening and they still have an ability to adapt, which many of us, including myself, we kind of lost that ability. Um, so, but the problem is obviously there. It means that people are, are moving to the cities. They're losing their livelihood because many were farmers or fishermen. Um, but the Bangladeshi government is one of the governments who I met who who's really paying attention to this. Um, and it means that, that, I mean, the people who are moving now, we would call them climate uh, refugees. The problem with climate refugees is that it's still not recognized by the UNHCR or anyone else. Um, it's very difficult or let's say impossible to get asylum for those, uh, for those reasons. Um, interesting that, People said to me outside Bangladesh, well, these people should not live in a delta. Welcome to the delta of the Netherlands, <laughs> below sea level. Um, Kiribati, anyone knows who, where it is? It's, uh, you all know it's the country which reaches the millennium first or, the, or the, the new year first. It's a country in the Pacific located exactly between uh, India, uh, between uh, Fiji and Hawaii. It has the size of India, actually, although it's mostly ocean. Um, and it's a country. Um, so I was interested what, what it means, if, what it means for, for this country if it would cease to exist. It's no, not higher than one, one and a half meter above sea level. And this is basically what you see is the high tide, the normal high tide, uh, what people experience. So they protect themselves by sandbags but they don't know where to go. There was one family who requested asylum in New Zealand. 
uh, it was granted, but then it was uh, at Supreme Court, it was uh, denounced. So they had to go back. Um, Miami, I don't have to tell you where that is. Um, was very interesting for me uh, to, to get there because I started to understand there's a problem. The Dutch, as you might know, we, have, we are experts on coastal management, on water management, so the Dutch were called in to see how Miami could be protected. Um, but my, there's one problem in Miami, it's built on limestone. So that means that it's porous, so whatever dike or sea wall you build under it, uh, on it, the water will just go under it. Um, which means that most likely Miami Beach needs to be evacuated by probably 2050. Um, they have this special thing only in Miami, which they call sunny day flooding, which means that it floods when the sun is out and the sky is blue. Uh, but it, it's the high tide which comes through the drainage. New York is a different story. That New York had a wake up call 10 years ago, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, which, which was quite a shock uh, that this could happen. So New York did develop a master plan to, to protect Manhattan, uh, but 10 years later, the plan is there, but I don't think that any construction has happened yet, so another superstorm could hit uh, any time. Um, well, we obviously we all saw the horrific images from, uh, from the hurricane on Florida. Um, so what you see is, is a hurricane which was like think, three years ago, it's Hurricane Michael which also hit Florida. But it made me wonder really uh, that we have to rethink where we are building and where we are uh, constructing. Because the major damage uh, which we saw with Hurricane I uh, Ian was on Fort Myers Beach, which is a barrier island. Personally, not personally, but I believe you should not build on barrier islands because they are called barrier islands because they are they are to protect you from the sea. Um, Jakarta, uh, Jakarta has also a special issue, which is that the city is sinking. Um, they are extracting too much groundwater. The city is about 20 million people now. So they're extracting groundwater, which means that the city is sinking by 25 centimeters a year. Um, so again, this is also how people live at high tide, um, which is a daily event. The Dutch came, there was a master plan to protect it, but it, uh, it went down because of financial issues, because of protests also of the people. Um, and it's been decided now that the city will be relocated, so they're building a new capital. Um, it seems though that the government is moving, not the people. Um, well, the Netherlands, uh, it wasn't actually included because the Netherlands, you know, I mean, as I said, it's, uh, we feel safe. We don't have floods here. Um, until a couple of years ago, uh, when a report came out, which was requested by the government, to look at the worst case scenario. Because the question is often, why do we always think it's not so bad if we talk about the climate crisis and we never look at the, at the worst case scenario? The recent IPCC report actually did. But the worst case scenario for the Netherlands is if we don't bring the temperature down as we agreed in Paris to possibly one and a half degrees, the sea level could rise in the Netherlands one to three meters by the end of the century. We can deal with one meter. We can maybe deal with two meters, but if it's three meters, it becomes very, very problematic. And what we often forget is that it took us 40 years after this disaster in 1953 to complete the Delta Works, as they were called. So it means that the clock is ticking anywhere in the world. And um, if we don't act now, today, um, I don't think there will be another city lab in Amsterdam in a, in a century from now. Um, because that's what the Dutch coast will look like uh, in the future. So, I mean, maybe we can adapt, and maybe it's not so bad to adapt, actually. Um, we get German already in school, so... Um. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
<laughs> Good afternoon and thank you for being here. My name is Adam Freed and I'm a principal at Bloomberg Associates and was previously the sustainability director for the city of New York. Now this morning we heard Mayor Bloomberg talk about the real world consequences of climate change which are happening. And the past two years have shown the devastating impacts that flooding, particularly extreme rainfall, can have in cities. Here in Europe, last year over 200 people died from summer floods. Streets in London were transformed into rivers by storms so strong that they're referred to now as water bombs. And 20 people in my home city of New York passed away, many in their basement apartments, from Hurricane Ida. And this year, this summer, we've already seen the floods in Pakistan, killed more than 1,700 people, and almost two million homes were destroyed. As we heard in this morning's panel about heat, the impacts of climate change are not future warnings, but a clear and present danger here and now. In fact, many of you took a snap poll earlier today that found that over 50% of you have experienced flooding in your cities within the past two years. In cities that we know, and as we've heard about in a variety of different topics today, are on the front lines of all the impacts that we're facing. So I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome for national and international experts who are grappling with the realities of living with extreme weather events in their cities. Mayor Randall Woodfin from Birmingham, Alabama, Hank Ovink, UN Special Envoy for Water, Pierre Francesco Moran, Deputy Mayor for Urban Planning and Housing in Milan, and Melissa Martin, chef and owner of the Mosquito Supper Club in New Orleans, and I will also put a plug in, author of one of my new favorite cookbooks that you can find hopefully at your local bookstore or ask for it. <laughs> Uh, which is a Mosquito Supper Club, Cajun Recipes from a Disappearing Bayou. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that means at the end uh, when we get to the panels. But I want to start with you, Mayor Woodfin. You live in a city that actually doesn't have any major rivers, and yet Birmingham has experienced a series of significant floods during your terms and many just this year. Can you paint a picture for the audience about what's happening in your city? Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Adam made one mistake. Um, there are three national and international experts. I'm just a little <laughs> over here. I don't know about the expert part, but I will tell you, the city of Birmingham is a southern city founded in 1871. For you all who don't know, um, from a landmass, you know, to topographical standpoint, it sits in the valley. And this valley is sur surrounded by mountains. It has all the ingredients that make steel. So like a lot of other southern cities, um, we've had our boom and our bust. We had our boom in the late 18th, early 19th century. In the 1970s, when the steel industry changed, um, so that we lost a lot of jobs at a, one time. Um, and our height of our population was 340,000 people that now has about 200,000 residents. Um, we've had to grapple with, um, unfortunately, environmental injustice stemming from soil and air issues for quite some time. And serving as mayor the last five years, what I did know when I signed up for this job was that I would also have to compete with extreme um, weather events, such as flash flooding. Um, remember, we sit in a bowl, so we've already been dealing with tornadoes um, pretty much since time. But over the last two years, with these extreme weather events um, and the humidity in Birmingham and all these other things that converge at one time, just since January 1, everybody, we've had 86 water rescues in a city that's landlocked. That's kind of extreme when you think about it. Um, for firemen and fire women who sign up for a job to put out fires, but they're doing water rescues. And so from that standpoint, we have about 27,000 um, inlets in our city where we've assessed about 18,000 over the last few years. And many of them have lived their lifespan, they're expired. And so just in context, if we wanted to pave every street in our city, it would be about a $50 million price tag but to get our stormwater infrastructure up to where it needs to be is at least a half a billion dollar price tag. And so from a neighborhood revitalization standpoint, there's much to do around this, but we're, we're seeking solutions, um, which includes um, how do we repurpose our empty lots in the city that's decreasing population by planting trees and other things to absorb, um, not some of this, this runoff water, but other things as well. In addition to that, we're looking at how do we support our greenhouse and be creative with our horticulture team, um, as well as how do we get out of the asphalt parking lot business, which all these weather events allows 
rain to just sit on top because it doesn't have anywhere to go. And so these extreme weather events from a municipal mayor standpoint will take partnership, partnerships from our working with our federal government and its infrastructure law. Um, this bill is a once in a lifetime for a city like Birmingham to get water infrastructure right. Um, and that will be probably our main partner. Now, Hank, many cities have been grappling with sea level rise and coastal flooding for decades. In fact, you and I first met in New York after Superstorm Sandy when you were advising both the city and the, and the federal government on responses to that. But more and more, as we're hearing from Birmingham and other cities, cities are dealing with extreme rainfall and unprecedented surface flooding, something they've never seen. You've been advancing water as a global issue, including planning for the UN 2023 Water Conference. What is that event and, and how do cities and flooding fit into that agenda? Uh, uh, thanks, Adam, and uh, thanks to the mayor also for ex explaining the, the local challenges. Uh, water comes at us in many ways and forms. Uh, too much, but also with heat, too little, and of course, pollution impacting uh, our infrastructure and environment, uh, but also our health, uh, increasing in quality, uh, you know, hitting the most vulnerable first and foremost, with then, of course, the longest time to get back on their feet. And cities are the hotspots where these events happen, eh, with too much, too little, and the pollution of water. So that urban water agenda is of critical importance if we want to leapfrog towards a better future. And we spent 99 cents out of every dollar on stupid infrastructure globally. <laughs> and only that, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, th it's actually a very sad story because only in that 1% where we see salvation and beautiful projects, we think, oh, we're doing so great. No, we're not. Um, we're messing up. So that alternative, <laughs> that alternative that cities, community-led, uh, uh, society-based, can bring to the agenda of the UN is of critical importance because it's in that alternative where we have to scale and replicate the things that work and not scale and replicate the things that do don't, don't work. Now the UN, eh, the United Nations, uh, seen often as a very complex um, thing. <laughs> I want to make sure I use the right language here. <laughs> um, this is where you can see a special envoy status yeah. comes in <laughs> handy. <laughs> Water touches upon everything in life. It's health, it's inequality, it's climate, it's infrastructure, it's cities, the environment, biodiversity. So water underpins everything we have. But the way we treat it, the way we organize it, the way we invest in it, actually undermines everything we have. And we just have a hard time understanding that. It's organized so fragmented, it has poor visibility, it's not top of the agenda. 1977, yeah, so I was 10, uh, I don't remember this, but the UN hosted the first conference on water, and at last. Eh? Next year will be the second in the history of the UN. Uh, I have the honor to lead the Netherlands in our co-hostship of this conference, and we want to bring every voice to that conference. Not a conference to talk, but a conference to commit to action. This is not a negotiation. Water has no treaty in the UN, there's, you know, we, it, it's totally not organized, but what we bring there are commitments that come from communities, from NGOs, from individuals, from mayors, from private sector, from academia, as well as from national governments. In these coalitions of the willing is an agenda that helps us present an alternative for the things we're doing today. And I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. The next time I'll be 100 and I don't know. Eh? So <laughs> if we only do it once. We better do it right. Uh, water is your best bet when it comes to investment. It is the thing you have to believe in. Uh, uh, but as a water ambassador, I've, I still, people too often agree with me and then do nothing, eh? go back to normal. Uh, and I think now is an opportunity where we can focus the attention on water insecurity, water and health and inequality and urbanization and food security, and then say, hey, wow, if we invest in water, it trickles down into everyone and every aspect in our society. If we get this right, there is an alternative. And if we can scale that alternative, there is a better future. I love that concept of water underpinning everything in life, and I actually think it goes very well into Melissa's book and, and the work that she's dedicated herself for. You know, Melissa, so far we, we've talked about the physical and economic impacts of flooding, 
but you focused on its impacts on cultural heritage and, and a way of life in Louisiana and where you grew up. In your book, you, you talk about the risks of climate change and how, what it poses for Cajun culture and the community you grew up in. And you even highlight and call out southern towns in southern Louisiana that you, you talk about as the first climate refugees mm -hmm. in the US as their land is disappearing. How is climate change threatening Cajun and Louisiana culture and, and how do we go about protecting it? So I grew up in a small town uh, called Chauvin, Louisiana, which is an hour and a half southwest of um, New Orleans. Um, on, uh, on the coast of South Louisiana, we've lost 2,000 square miles of land, and we're losing land faster than um, almost anywhere else in the world. So um, 2,000 square miles, that would be Delaware just disappearing. And I don't know a lot about the culture of Delaware, but um, I would <laughs> like to know if it's going to disappear. Um, and so uh, whenever I started the restaurant, it was to tell the story of this place that um, is 300 years old, but is steeped in culture and traditions. It's a fishing village. Um, and then I put that story on, um, I put that story on a table to tell that story. And then I did again in the book. I think that whenever you have these complex issues and people don't understand them, it's best to sort of try to deliv deliver the message every possible way you can. And so I used it um, at a restaurant and then I used it in um, the cookbook. Um, you know, Chauvin has um, a saltwater intrusion problem but because of the oil industry. Um, we, the oil industry dug um, 10,000 canals, I think, in an 80-year period, which caused saltwater intrusion, and that's why we lost our land. We already have subsidence, and yes, we have hurricanes, and yes, we will have climate change, and our water is going to rise. But really, it's the uh, damming of the Mississippi River, and it's the oil industry, so it's kind of like a lot of man's problems um, of... Um, dealing with water and dealing with uh, the land that we had in South Louisiana. Um, if I imagine it before the oil field, I imagine a quite a sustainable place, like a culinary Eden. Um, people were doing things quite right. And I think whenever I think about the future, I think about rolling back sort of primitively, like I asked you the other day, or just a little while ago, like, why don't we have cisterns? <laughs> you know, like, why aren't we like collecting rain? After Hurricane Ida, after, um, Everyone flooded. I went down to help my parents who didn't have a roof, and it was continuously raining, and then it just rained some, you know, um, insane amount, and I they didn't have water for three weeks. So the first thing I did was build a rain catchment system, and so they would have water. And then it's like, well, but nobody else in the show van was doing this. <laughs> and so I think, like, we need to start, like, really basic in communities like that. Um, um, before we can tackle the larger problems. <laughs> Excellent. Now, it's the story of Moran. Moran also faces extreme rainfall, and, and you've had a number of floodings. Now, under Mayor Sala's leadership, you've been working to really rewrite the DNA of the city. And, and for those of you who haven't been to Milan in a long time, I urge you to go and see the change that's happening on the ground. You've been transforming underused roadways into pedestrian plazas. You've on your way to planting three million trees. You're depaving large swaths of the city. Why are these actions so important to the city's future? Well, uh, if uh, we want to face uh, some problem like f uh, flooding, uh, of course we have some uh, short or medium term solution that is uh, infrastructures. But infrastructures sometimes are uh, the solution for today, but a problem for tomorrow. Of course we have to do it uh, if we want to be sure to save lives uh, in flooding situations, but we have to think that uh, or we change the way we imagine our cities or we will face uh, problem uh, that will be bigger and bigger. Uh, floodings uh, uh, last year are worse than floodings uh, some years ago because uh, it rains less but harder and harder. So we have uh, to imagine uh, cities that are different. That is what we are uh, doing all together uh, even uh, today. That is why we are moving, as you said, uh, from abandoned rayard to new places where 65% of all the areas, it's uh, seven different areas, will be green. We have uh, we mapped the uh, alpha million of square meters uh, of areas we can um, make uh, some depaving, uh, and we want to do half of this uh, gaul uh, in the next uh, ten years. That is part of a strategy where, um, in a dense city like uh, Milan is and like many European cities are, uh, we want to uh, reduce uh, um, uh, soil consumption. Uh, and we think we can do it, uh, and we can also save place that the other people can use for new pedestrian area and new leisure area that is the future of the city. Now, Mayor Woodfin, I think everyone on the panel has talked about it's not just a climate challenge we're facing, but these are man-made challenges. 
Um, as mayor, you've made racial equity, environmental justice, really a central focus of your administration. I'd argue that climate change is only partly to blame for the flooding that we're seeing, um, that much of it is occurring not by accident, but by design and how we designed our cities. In the US, much of that design was shaped by redlining and historic disinvestment in communities of color, um, very, very deliberately so. How are race and equity, how have they impacted flooding in Birmingham and how you're looking to respond to it? So, so race uh, sits at the center of the city of Birmingham um, and it's been probably since its inception. Um, I would dare say we were probably um, the poster child for redlining neighborhoods. So the city of Birmingham is a city made up of 23 communities, 99 neighborhoods. And when in this steel industry, um, black residents and their neighborhoods were right by these plants. And so well before we talk about um, these extreme weather patterns, um, the intentional design of redlining neighborhoods, um, putting black residents, a city that's now 70% black, putting black residents um, near these smokestacks, um, living in floodplains, living in areas where your ingress and egress is surrounded by train tracks on all sides. All of this was definitely intentionally deliberate. And so in the last five years, everything we, we do is centered around um, justice, racial equity. We've actually created the Mayor's Office of Social Justice and Racial Equity where um, climate change has to be a part of the conversation um, because these extreme weather, weather patterns are affecting those neighborhoods, those same neighborhoods I just described, more so than other areas of town where they may stay on hills or heights. Now, Melissa, you've talked about in your book, you refer to water as our lifeline and our dark shadow. I'm wondering what you meant by that and, and you know how cities that can face the circumstances that you're already facing now, very much the canary in the coal mine, can learn from the situation on the Gulf Coast. Well, I mean, I grew up in a town that's all fishermen. All the livelihood was fishing. Um, and so it was our lifeline. When I got off of boats, I would bob up and down because we were so <laughs> used to just being on boats. It's not only how um, people made a living, but how they feed themselves. My parents still eat 90% of what they um, fish themselves. Um, and like Ponishan, the um, Native American tribe that's been moved off their land, There's, they've been, you know, the first climate refugees, they've been moved to a place that um, is not near water. Um, and so in order to be able to feed themselves, uh, they'll have to travel. So that's like a very small, um, you know, um, example of a much, much larger problem because South Louisiana pushes out so much seafood. Um, and so we have to fix the problem. Um, we have to build more land there. Um, we have to stop um, the saltwater um, intrusion. Um, or we're going to lose a lot of security. You know, the Port of New Orleans is um, the largest port in the country, I think. And um, it, it's just important. Now, I want to make sure that we end on a positive note and, and with the <laughs> message of hope. We, we hear a lot of doom and gloom. <laughs> I wonder for each of you, you know, what's the solution to flooding you want to see more of? Uh, or what action do you want audiences to take? And, and Hank, you have you know, about a, 100 different cities represented here, 40 mayors. Uh, what do you want them to take away when it comes to water? Maybe we'll, we'll go quickly in order. No, I, as I said, water presents us with the alternative. Invest in water, it trickles down to every aspect in our society. So uh, get together and act. And I think on the city scale, in your communities, this is where you can make it happen. I started a program in Asia called Water as Leverage, really using water as a catalyst for sustainable development, equity, climate action. And it is community-led, community-based, with international organizations and expertise, and we're in this pressure cooker way, try building innovative solutions that present us with a better future. So it's amazing, it is possible, but we have to dare to do it. Eh? And also overcome the distrust. Eh? Uh, step over and say, okay, we, are, we might disagree politically and uh, from our backgrounds, but if we start to work together, we can build that collective capacity. So yeah, there is a better future if we focus on water.
Melissa? I think we have so many problems in South Louisiana. This is a really hard um, question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say really small. I think that everybody needs to have a rain catchment. You know, right. when we're in a, a situation where we're having water issues and there's no water for three weeks because of a hurricane, like why won't we have rain catchment? Why don't we have large rain catchments? And then why can't we recycle that water? Um, I think that that is um, something small, but uh, it's such a larger problem. Uh, it's such a larger fix for yeah. I agree. Uh, we shouldn't treat water as uh, n uh, not being part uh, of a system. So we can talk about water, but also land, about uh, food, about uh, part of a community. Second, water has no border, not uh, administratives and not for countries. So we should uh, have the capability to cooperate with different administration, different states to solve the problems. Adam, I would just say water, as we know, is a basic necessity of life. As a quality of life issue from a municipal standpoint, I would just hope that, you know, it doesn't have to be a divide on, on solving this issue. It doesn't have to be Republican, Democrat, urban, rural. This is an issue we all should be behind trying to figure out how to solve, particularly on the extreme weather pattern side. So I think we've heard collective action, taking the, the small steps that are necessary, valuing water, and, and I'm, I'm going to quote you on the dare to do. Right. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
here we are painting the world's largest mural, not because we want to hold a record, but because it's our stories that need to be told and to remind ourselves that we need to continue to work together. Gleo, why was it important for you to work on this project? And what has happened in Wichita since? Eh, Gleo, ¿por qué fue importante para trabajar en este proyecto? ¿Y qué ha pasado en Wichita desde que estabas trabajando en este proyecto? Bueno, primero que todo, quiero agradecer a todas las personas que están aquí en este momento dispuestos a escuchar. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who's here and prepared to listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 eh, este proyecto en realidad toma importancia en el momento en que surge de la comunidad, es para la comunidad y termina con la comunidad. Well, this project was important because it was a project that was uh, made for the community, came from the community, and when it was for the benefit of the community. Este proyecto inicia con Armando Minjares, la persona que habla en el video. And this project began with Armando Minjares, who you saw in the video. Y él es una persona que ha estado trabajando por los derechos a migrar desde que vive y es residente en Estados Unidos, Kansas. And he's been uh, working um, on immigration rights since he's been living and working in Kansas. Y por supuesto es artista y ha buscado las maneras de cómo ejercer es, en estos mundos modernos el arte, ¿no? Cómo ser artista y poder... Eh, unir la comunidad y generar los diálogos invisibles que tiene la comunidad. Um, he's an artist and he's been finding a way of actually to uh, work his profession in this modern world uh, of, and be an artist in such a way that he can actually unite the community and have the invisible uh, dialogues that happen in the community made more visible. So, cuando tú me preguntas qué es lo importante de Wichita, en Wichita es un proyecto en el que nace con Armando y la comunidad termina apoyando durante tres meses en el invierno para poder crear este sueño, el sueño de poder sentirse orgullosos del origen y de donde vivimos. Um, you say, the, what's the importance of the Wichita project? Well, it was born with Armando, uh, but it was a, a, a project in which the community supported us for the three coldest months in winter, and it was, able, and it was a project that actually fulfilled the, the dream of being able to feel, feel that you actually um, uh, were, uh, could give voice to your origins and have your origins respected. You mentioned briefly backstage about a transformation mm -hmm. of one of the contributors to this project, a graffiti artist. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly, briefly tell that story? Ya has entendido la pregunta, ok. Este proyecto fue realizado y apoyado por las personas que están viendo en esta foto. Ok, well this project was uh, all carried out by the six people that you see in this photograph. Este proyecto es la prueba viviente de lo que puede realmente generar un mural y transformar la vida de la comunidad. And this uh, project was living proof of what it is to actually produce a mural and actually transform uh, the life of the community. Un ejemplo es Quantis, un asistente del proyecto. Eh, Quantis estaba al margen de la ley por el hecho de este pintar graffiti y de no ser, eh, del graffiti no ser bienvenido Bajo los marco, bajo el mar, mar, marco de la ley de la ciudad. Uh, one example of the transformational nature of this project was Quantis, who was uh, an assistant on this project. Um, he was always living on the edge of the law uh, because he uh, painted so much uh, graffiti and he wasn't really very welcome in mainstream society. Entonces, en el momento en que él empieza a trabajar con nosotros, en el momento en que él se siente parte del proyecto y la comunidad lo percibe como parte del proyecto, durante después de terminar el proyecto, él se convierte en el artista de la ciudad, él se convierte en el artista que promueve los eventos culturales y el artista que trabaja en pro de la comunidad. Um, as, uh, 
uh, the minute that Qantas became part of this project and was working with us, the community could see that he was actually working on this project with us. Uh, then thing, there was a turning point um, because when the uh, project ended, he became the uh, city artist and he was the person that actually started cultural events and that people went to for cultural events. Oh, the t this clock is evil. Um, <laughs> next, thank you for this next photo. You collaborate with the community in so much of your work. What community are we looking at in this photo? Esta comunidad es en Creston, Iowa. Es una invitación que recibí tres años después de haber realizado Wichita. Y en realidad esta invitación surge en el momento en el que las personas que se inspiraron in Wichita, in the project anterior. Um, this was taken in Cresto in Iowa, and it was a, 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 another community project that um, grew out of the whole Wichita project. Mm. Mm -hmm. Next photo. Exactly. <laughs> That's the whole reason we put this in there, because we could predict your response. There is a lot of symbolism in your work, mm -hmm. the eyes, the paint, the types of people that you focus on, what impression are you trying to leave on a community? What impressions have communities left on you? Bien, hay muchos, uh, mucho simbolismo en su trabajo, los ojos, los colores tan vivos, las personas. ¿Qué impresiones que tú quieres dejar sobre la comunidad y qué impresión ha dejado la comunidad sobre ti? Intentar dejar una impresión en la comunidad es algo muy pretencioso. He aprendido eso en el camino de mi carrera. During the course of my career, I've learned that trying to leave an impression on the community is an incredibly pretentious thing to try to do. Yes. <laughs> Pero la comunidad se ha dejado demasiado en mí. However, the community has left a very big impression on me. Debido a que cuando empiezas a intervenir murales a gran formato en una ciudad, empiezas a dialogar directamente con la comunidad. And that's because when you actually try, uh, start to intervene in a city and paint murals on this scale, then you actually start to have very important uh, dialogues and conversations with the city itself. Además que vives en la ciudad, cuando eh, realizas intervención mural, vives en la calle, habitas la calle, más de 12 horas al día y esto implica que empiezas a vivir como las personas realmente habitan ese espacio. And then moreover, when you're actually doing uh, a piece of street art, you're living in the street, you're working in the street for at least 12 hours a day, so you're actually inhabiting that space in the way that many other people inhabit that space. Y estamos de acuerdo en que la ciudad condiciona la mente de nuestra comunidad, la mente del individuo que lo habita. And we all agree that a city actually affects the frame of mind that you have. It actually changes your point of view and it molds uh, your, your mind. Entonces, en ese es el momento en el que no importa exactamente qué es lo, lo que ponga gráficamente en el muro, sino cómo eso va a dialogar y va a habitar y va a cohabitar con las personas que se quedan. So, in a way, it doesn't, it's not really important what kind of image you actually put on the mural. What's important is the, that the process, the dialogue that you have, how you collaborate with the community, uh, what exchanges you have as you're putting that, mur that uh, image on a, on a wall. Para finalizar, y un gran ejemplo sería el anterior de Creston, Iowa, cuando estuvimos trabajando con 150 niños que no tenían la oportunidad de poder ejercer un workshop de este tipo porque están lejos de las grandes ciudades. And just as a final example, and it's a, it's a big one, in Cresto, Iowa, the previous photographs that you showed, that was a project that we did with 150 uh, children who hadn't had the opportunity to take part in any kind of art or painting workshop because they lived so far away from a big city. Mm -hmm. That is all the time we have for this. I know, that's the right emotional response, also <laughs> predicted. What's important to me from this is telling the story of the city, as you said so eloquently, is not a top-down 
exercise. It's not a pretension that an artist projects on the people. It's something you create with the people. So, gracias por tu trabajo. Es un honor muy grande. Muy grande. Leo. Thank you. Great to see all of you. My name is Nula. Lovely to meet all of you and have you here. It actually really leads on from what we're hearing there about cities. Uh, and I'm wondering, have you all made the 10 friends that you were told to make last night? Uh, well, we're going to talk a little bit about loneliness and also urban cures for that. I want to start actually with a poll. Uh, that I was just showing backstage, because some of you have been uh, putting some information into the app. Here we go. How concerned are you that mental health trauma remains a long-term consequence of the pandemic in your city? And if you see very concerned and somewhat concerned, we're up there to 93%. So I want to delve into that, and particularly, it's today is actually World Mental Health Day, so we're perfectly placed with my three guests to talk about this. Um, is it fair, Andrea, to blame cities for having a detrimental effect on mental health? Well, it is true that several epidemiological studies have shown that uh, people who live in cities are more likely to suffer from mental health conditions. The point is, we are not sure about the mechanisms. What are the pathways linking uh, living in cities with mental health? And this is what we need to understand. We we need to understand the, un the underlying mechanisms so we can then target these mechanisms. But I'd like to just uh, turn your question around slightly and just point to the fact that while it's true that urban environments can increase the, the, the risk of mental illness, perhaps we should think about how they can actually strengthen uh, mental health. So how we can build more resilient, healthier cities. My suggestion is that we focus on the positives of living in a city, as opposed to what we've done historically, which is focusing on the negatives. Let me throw that to you, Elizabeth. You're nodding. Yeah, absolutely. Andrea's right. So a lot of what uh, we study is, is the why. And it turns out that a city or a workplace or an online community um, often have risk factors associated with mental health challenges. But you know, cities are also where we connect with people, where we find our community. Uh, workplaces can be an opportunity to, to build meaningfulness. All of those factors are opportunities um, to improve mental health and reduce things like burnout or anxiety. So it really is up to us to figure out how to use those tools for, for improved mental health. And we'll get into some of those concrete examples. But what about you, Christian? You work with design. You hear I'm asking if it's fair that cities get a bad rap. Well, they may. But the beautiful thing is that we design cities. We design the context, the environment in which we move, in which we work, where we go to school and so on. And so the beauty of that, of course, is that we can redesign it. And I think the big question that the reframing here is, is perfect from a design perspective, because then what, how would we, in practice, work with shaping a different set of conditions, a different context where people would thrive? in their everyday lives. Well, you used the word thrive, and when I looked into your work, I noticed you had uh, this term, thriving youth, and imagine if, and I love the idea of that. I think it sounds wonderful if we had teenagers that were thriving in cities. But to be honest, most articles, what I read here or see, is about youth, in particular, very much struggling. So how are you going to change a city that has roots so deep and move it into, I don't know, a different system. Yeah. Yeah, so we call it thriving youth because in Denmark, one in six uh, young people when they turn 18 will, will have a diagnosis in the psychiatric system. So it's a huge uh, societal challenge we're, we're facing and working on in our context. The way we work with it is, of course, first and foremost, by involving youth uh, in uh, workshops and dialogues and creative exercises that are about imagining a very different future. And in fact, the way we did it uh, and are doing it right now is to imagine a future city. We call it uh, our town or our city, uh, in Danish, of course. Uh, it means Vorby, okay. our town. And the idea is to say, what would a narrative be like? What would the stories be like? How would young people live their everyday lives 
uh, if they were thriving, if the conditions were different, if we moved it from an individual problem to a collective problem, if we created opportunities to be much more uh, connected with nature, for example, even in an urban environment. And so we're creating right now video stories and films from young people from the future. Okay. What do you think about that, Andre, when you think about trying to create a whole different system? Is it doable? Uh, I think it's very exciting. And I think it's right to use the kind of techniques that you are employing, uh, so participatory techniques where we hear young people's voices. But equally, it's as a scientist, I would say that it's really important to adopt an evidence-based approach. So we need to collect data about what features of the physical environment, the social environment, are having an impact on how we feel our well-being, our mental health, and um, how this features interact with each other, which is why it's so important to, to, to collect detailed information and then think about what this means in terms of how we design our cities. Well, I've been getting notifications uh, from Andrea's app because there is an app called Urban Mind. Maybe you want to explain it uh, to our audience, what it is, and we can talk about the findings well, as, as part well. of this effort to better understand how different aspects of urban living is affecting us. Um, together with architects, urban designers, and neuroscientists, uh, we've developed a, a smartphone app called Urban Mind. It works on Android, iPhone, and basically people download this app, and for about two weeks they get various prompts at random times, uh, asking them to, to report how they're feeling, where they are, and the app uses geotagging as well, and also monitors mobility, but it's, uh, it's anonymous. And at the end, we'll be able to uh, link this data that individuals have provided us with large-scale data sets that are already in place, such as air pollution, uh, green infrastructure, and this really helps us open all sorts of doors for understanding how these different features are affecting us, and our results are already very interesting. So if we were doing it now, for example, I'd be talking about grey carpet under my feet, I'd be talking about a large room with hundreds of people, I'd be talking about the lights, perhaps, maybe how I'm feeling, very happy to be here. <laughs> uh, but what were the findings when you got all the da data so yeah. far, and perhaps who also has been inputting yeah. it? So we wanted to start small, we wanted to do a simple study in London, but as soon as we put the app on on the various stores, we realized that people wa were downloading it all over the world. So we now have about 40,000 participants from all over the world. The strongest effects appear to be the ones of nature. So um, seeing or hearing birds, being able to see trees, uh, also being by water is a very powerful factor that influences mental well-being. So all of these natural features are associated with increases in mental well-being. Interestingly, the effect is there not only for so-called healthy people, people who haven't had the diagnosis of mental illness in the past, but the effects are very much there for people who suffer from depression, uh, psychosis, and so on. So everyone benefits. At the same time, it's important to acknowledge that nature is not a panacea. So, for example, if you are in a park and there's lots of trees, lots of water, lots of birds, but you're not feeling safe, mm -hmm. what we find is that that actually leads to a decrease in mental health. So it's important to consider both the physical and the social aspects, and that's why design is so important. I want to jump in with Elizabeth there, because some of the words that you're talking about there as well, Andrea, I know your work is like 20% people more prone to depression or anxiety often in urban settings, but you've been working, Elizabeth, specifically with people that really have been feeling that, people on the front line. Uh, talk about some of the methods you're using to try and understand where that isolation or loneliness occurs within cities. Yeah, absolutely. So, so my research really focuses, as you said, on people who um, are tasked in their everyday work to uh, not only handle other people's trauma, but also internalize that and deliver services. So think about your social workers, your teachers, your emergency dispatchers, your correctional officers. And we see across the board, um, even before COVID, there were real challenges with burnout that of course have been exacerbated mm -hmm. uh, significantly. And I think this is such a great panel because uh, the ideas really complement each other. So the social connection aspect that Andrea was talking about is really where we focused our work. So what we've been doing with a lot of cities in this room is think about how we can create connection and support amongst frontline workers who otherwise are not connected. So think about uh, connecting dispatchers across different cities, anonymously and online, 
where they can share their experience, where they can share advice. And what we find in, in pretty rigorous evaluations um, that once you create a system for people to share advice and community, um, burnout goes down. Six months later, we see improvements in resignations and turnover. In our more recent work on correctional officers, we're even seeing shifting mindsets towards jail residents, so in, in terms of the actual service delivery. And so something that seems like it's just a benefit for the mental health of the worker actually has these spillover effects on service delivery. But why do you think, if it's possible to know, does that work in a way that, like my organization, I'm from the BBC, like we have a hotline, for example, that employees can call if they have uh, mental health worries? Yeah, so, I mean, those programs are fantastic, and there's a lot of ways that we can provide help for, for employees. As a behavioral scientist, the one question I always ask of those programs is, how do you get people to use it? And one of the big challenges that we face with a lot of these programs is that the people who need the support uh, might not be calling. Um, mental health is still very stigmatized. Um, they might not know they need the support. And so one thing that we've learned from doing these programs with physician mothers, with correctional officers, um, and with dispatchers is that you don't need to call it a mental health intervention for it to have these effects. In mm. fact, saying, you know, you can support each other because only you know what you're going through. Only other peers or your colleagues know what you're going through ends up bringing a much larger group of people into this space than would uh, be comfortable calling a hotline. Christian. Yeah, so when we talk about shifting this space, it's really about shifting systems and ways we think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, the hypothesis we're exploring in, in Denmark is a shift from individualizing mental health to understanding it's a, it's a collective challenge, a problem, but it's also that's where the solution space is. So how can you shift to a sense of belonging to community? That's clearly something cities and, and towns and, uh, and, and neighborhoods can do, but it's actually also something that, of course, happens in the virtual space, or can happen in the virtual space. So if you think we, can, we should address, you know, how to address mental thriving for young people, there's no avoiding digital. Mm -hmm. There's no avoiding are you thriving or not thriving as you go and do your things on your devices. Yep. And here we're exper experimenting with, you know, what could the future be of actually uh, getting energy and support and community sense of belonging also in a digital space. I think the sense of belonging I is really interesting. But then, Christian, to you, a 15-year-old that is thriving, what does he or she or they look like? Well, we're still working on this uh, future uh, by, by uh, you know, long-term future of, of, of thriving for young people. But uh, just as a, as a simple example that connects to, to the point about uh, nature is that even though you're going to school in a city, in the future, some of the stories from young people are about how do you bring in nature in, mm -hmm. how do you go into nature, what about if nature was a classroom for a while, uh, how do we think about just that aspect in a day in a life of, a, of an educational experience in, a, in an urban environment. Yeah, so actually changing the classrooms. But I wonder, is the is there the will there within governments to try and make that happen, particularly at this time, we're post-pandemic, cost of living crisis, I mean, that is what's headlines, is not people talking about how to take the classroom out into nature. Well, I do think one thing that is exciting um, is that we're shifting to talking about these issues more. So okay. um, when I first was asked to work on this issue, it came to me as a turnover question. So a lot of cities said, you know, we're having a problem with turnover and absenteeism. It was through research we figured out that it was in fact a burnout problem, but it was only 2019 when, when even the WHO um, uh, uh, thought of burnout as an occupational phenomenon. It's only now it's that we have time. yeah, mental health guidelines for work. So um, these problems have existed for a really long time, but being able to name them and talk about them in this way and see the links to all the other things governments care about, like service delivery, like the turnover crisis, like safety, um, makes it a bigger part of the story. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, the safety, I think that's something we all see in the headlines when it comes to city crime. I mean, how many campaigns have we seen that have been run on that particular aspect? Uh, but do you think that can be transformed, you know, for leaders to actually take that on and be able to sell some of the concepts that you're talking about today? Maybe I'll start with you, Andrea. Well, I think governments have to because it's a win-win. Uh, I don't particularly like the word crisis because it's quite negative and it implies that there's no way out, but there is a mental health crisis amongst young people mm -hmm. at the moment due to the financial insecurity, due, due to the f pandemic. So all of these has consequ consequences for the individuals who are affected, but also for larger society and, and um, for the healthcare systems as well. So governments have to take action and prioritize this 
because, uh, because that will on not only help the individuals, but also the wider society. Um, if we think about hospitalizations, that's a huge driver of healthcare costs, which has direct implications for government finance. So this is the first reason why they have to take this seriously. And then the second reason is that people with mental health issues aren't just a small group of individuals who can be ignored. We're all on a mental health continuum. Mm -hmm. Some of us will struggle at some point. Some of us are perhaps a bit luckier, some, some of us less lucky, but it affects everyone in this room. That's why I, there is no choice. They have to take it seriously. Do you think, Christian, when you look at cities and the way they, they are designed, Who's doing it right? Is there anyone that you think, I don't know, is a leader in this field? Well, so, so we were discussing it uh, uh, earlier in the, in the before the panel, and uh, and we couldn't really come up with it with, with great case examples. I think we're actually on the cusp of something new, right? It's just recently been recognised uh, in terms of, of, of burnout and stress as a as a health uh, risk, and and uh, and and the role of cities moving from let's call it uh, physical infrastructure to in a way mental infrastructure. That's that's maybe the next thing we need to do. But I think there's evidence that we can do these things. We can change how it feels to move and be and live in a city. I, I can mention Copenhagen as an example that was recently named the safest uh, city uh, in the world. Uh, what's safety? Well, that's you know feeling that you can walk home at night as a, as a woman, perhaps, uh, in, in, the, in the streets and, uh, and feel safe. I can say that not everybody does feels, feels that way in Copenhagen either, uh, but it's better than elsewhere. Mm -hmm. what, what would it mean if, if we then took the attention towards mental health and, th and mental thriving and well-being? What would then the urban design look like? I think that's what we need to explore now. Anyone else like to pick up on the cities that maybe have made an impression? Well, I would like to give a concrete example. When I was working in Melbourne for about six months, I noticed how um, the, it was possible for young people to access mental health support on the high street. So there would be some shops and supermarkets where young people would go and do shopping, have a coffee with their friends. But then right there, there was also a very pleasant environment with fresh fruit, Wi-Fi, it wasn't stigmatizing, it wasn't depressing, uh, it was just very welcoming and, um, and young people would of course uh, be more open to the idea of seeking help I if this kind of uh, environments can be integrated within city centers. I often think it's like take if you're able to take the best parts of what various cities are doing. And you, Elizabeth, I'm just wondering, so you mentioned frontline dispatchers like 911 in the States, uh, you mentioned correctional officers, such stressful jobs. Yep. Do you think you can roll this out to other areas? What's, what's in your sights? I mean, I hope so. Part of what we, we try to do by, by co-designing these types of interventions with cities is um, not just, you know, find something flashy that, that requires a lot of resources or time, but really try to find solutions that, that are scalable. Um, and what we have found is that if you get the mechanism right, if you, if you really focus on the belonging or you, you focus on the social connection, you don't need high-cost, high-tech interventions to bring people together. Feeling understood, feeling valued is, is so um, central to how we think about mental health, and that's scalable. And just with your aspect as well, coming back to these emails that were sent, for example, um, I know you can't give us specifics, but, but what was it, do you think, that kind of spurred a sense of belonging perhaps between those people in a way that other ways to try and uh, combat loneliness, for example, didn't? Yeah, it turns out uh, if you ask people to give advice to others um, and you ask them to give advice to a newbie, for example, about what it's like on the job, they share. Uh, and that uh, is really beneficial for the advice giver as well as the advice taker. Um, so creating opportunities for people to, to share their experiences, just creating the space for it. We're not, you know, we're not just tracking people who actually used um, you know, the emails or the nudges. Just creating the space for that um, gives people a sense that they belong to a community of other people who understand them. Thank you, Elizabeth. And last thought, uh, Christian, do you think when we come back to City Lab in, a, I don't know, five, ten years' time that we're going to have this system redesign as you would like? I'd hope so, because the mechanisms, as we talked about, are really about human uh, thriving in general. And so we're moving from towards more community, more sense of belonging, more thriving, both in terms of nature, aesthetics, beauty. That's where cities need to go. Thank you. Thanks to my panel, to Andrea, Elizabeth, and Christian, and to you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Let me uh, first say that I am so inspired by all of you and what you're doing in your communities globally. And we know that local leadership is the level of government that's going to make a difference in the world. And so first, let me say thank you all for what you do. My name is Clarence Anthony. I'm the CEO and Executive Director of the National League of Cities. And one of the things I'll say, my journey in local government has been over three decades. Um, I served as the interim Secretary General of UCLG, located in Barcelona, Spain, where we lobbied the United Nations. I also had the honor of being the mayor of my hometown at the age of 24 in Florida. I didn't know a thing then, and I still don't know much now. But one of the things I can tell you is that local leadership truly has changed. How you lead and the manner in which you engage your citizens has truly changed over the years. But I will say one thing, the pandemic itself changed everything about what we do, how we do it, and how we lead. 2020 was one of those years that most of us will never, ever forget. It caused us to pause and reflect on our lives, the people in our lives, as well as the communities that we lead. It also changed everything about how we led. We stepped up as local leaders. You stepped up as local leaders. Without local leaders, Globally, we would not have overcome the challenge of COVID-19 and the pandemic. There's no way. Because many of you were out providing services, food, helping the elderly. And I must tell you, you should take a pause, in a sense, and breathe. Because that was one of the toughest times to lead. Because many in my environment, in the States, we watched elected officials pass, die, from working so hard to make sure that their residents got the services they needed. And it was local leaders that were the ones who had to educate their residents about, do you take the vaccination or not? So things have changed, and it's changed forever. And I think that's one of the things globally we have to recognize. It was also a time where, most importantly, it just, I think, it forced us to look at issues that we thought were mundane at some level. The issue of climate became in your face every day. I would say the issue of racial equity became on the front pages of America's cities and globally. It gave us an opportunity to just reimagine our communities, reimagine ways that we can engage our citizens, reimagine the ways that we can deliver services. So the evolving leadership responsibility really was in our face during the pandemic because most of us were sitting in front of a television. But it also provided a moment for us as municipal leaders, to have each other's back. It caused a connectivity that had never occurred before globally. And it changed the ability to call across any country and ask for help and support. We watched it in real time as individuals, with our family members, but also as leaders. We also saw where everything was about the lockdown, but it was about celebrations at times as well. This is a photo where you see people went out on the balconies and cheered for the frontline workers every day as they provided support. And before we knew it, it was happening everywhere. Videos went viral of that practice not just in Italy, but Asia, South America, all over the world. But we also saw similar 
protests in the Black Lives Matter movement. That was ignited by the murder of George Floyd in the U.S. But you would think that that was just a U.S. issue. It became a global issue for all of us throughout the world. Evolve, change. And I can tell you when I worked at UCLG, North American cities were not as global. They weren't connecting. But that change has occurred because we recognize that we all are in this together. Paris, Black Lives Matter cropping up throughout the world. We also looked at St. Paulo and beyond. In the last couple of years, cities across the world have suddenly imagined themselves as one community, one local government, one city. And we live in a time right now where divisions along race, gender, party, neighborhoods, economics is becoming the norm. And I can tell you that the level of government that's going to take us back on the right direction, it will be local government. It will be our mayors, our city council members, our city administrators, our innovators, using every tool you have to make sure that we are serving our residents. But this trend in terms of democracies and democracy and the culture of democracy is one that I am concerned about. And all of us should be concerned about that. Because it seems to be worsening in a way where we're, we're using technology and misinformation to cause us to pause and question democracy in a democratic system. Local leadership is going to be important. Local leadership will be the way in which we are able to turn some of these themes around. We're also seeing a lack of incivility in local government. Our citizens, we're seeing it where they are going against our family members, attacking you individually. And when I was a mayor, City Hall was at City Hall, not at the front doors of elected officials. That's a trend that we need to recognize, but I know that local leaders will be able to help us. And all of this is happening as this threat to democracy across the country, across the world, again, is happening. Our role as local officials, our role as mayors right now is essential because City Hall is the most trusted level of government and because cities are unifying places, people over politics, places where potholes, water, wastewater systems, police, fire, it ain't right wing, it ain't red wing. That's a southern Florida thing. It ain't. I know how to speak correctly. But anyway, <laughs> it really is not. It's a service issue. And one of the things that we got to model ourselves is to make sure that we don't get involved in the partisanship so that service, effective services are not provided. It is our moment to step up together as a world of cities, a world of leaders, one culture, one vision, one plan that's going to cause the world to recognize local leadership. Right now, we're seeing the power of local leadership prominently in Ukraine, where the challenge is profound and people are literally putting their lives on the line for democracy, the value of democracy. And back in March at the National League of Cities, we were honored to have the mayor of Lviv come and speak to us. And one of the things I remember most, and it was a moment that I'll never forget, when he raised his fist in solidarity and asked all of us to support him and his drive to be able to maintain a democratic system. 
he threw his arm up like this, and before I knew it, I have a, a large board of directors. All 50 of them raised their arms up in solidarity. And I've never seen that happen in any meeting in the United States of America. And I've been around a long time. That's what local leadership is about. That's what we are evolving to, and that's our responsibility. So, this convening is another one of those opportunities for us to learn about the innovation, to watch mayors share about what's going on in their city, and then they're going to pretend that they're not going to implement it when they go back and not give the other mayor credit. They do that all the time. So that's what we do here at City Lab. It is a network. It's a table. And I hope that we continue to break down those territorial lines that, we, that exist in the world and globe. That's what we do here. And at the National League of Cities, we're partnering with the Bloomberg Foundation to be able to get technical assistance out to those communities that are not able and, and set up to be able to provide services. Great partnership, but this City Lab is something I hope you will take advantage of. So finally, what's our responsibility? For me, if I was thinking about how it evolves, I would say 20 years ago, everybody looked to the federal government, the national government for solutions. That's no more. They're expecting you to solve all their issues. I would say years ago, the issues that you are facing were seen to be global issues, climate. But every local government, every innovator in this room know that the citizens are expecting you to solve that issue. So I must tell you, this quote, I say it all the time. If you want something done, give it to a mayor, give it to a local leader, and you'll get results. We know that. Let's own that and walk out of this conference and own the moment. Go back to your communities with these ideas and make sure every resident feel that they have a seat at the table and that local leaders will get it done. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome. This conversation is going to pull together many of the themes and topics of today's earlier session. I'm Kate Levin with Bloomberg Philanthropies, and I am joined here today by Amir Nazar Zouabi, who is the artistic director of an extraordinary project that engages some of the most urgent issues facing cities. It's called The Walk, and it is the journey of a young girl named Little Amal. And uh, we'd like to start by showing you some footage of her and that journey.
So this project came out of a theater piece that was developed uh, with refugees in uh, the Calais camp starting in 2015. Um, but refugee issues, as has been discussed so much already today, are with us uh, for climate change purposes alone. C40 estimates there may be as, as many as one billion refugees just because of climate by 2050. So uh, this issue is entirely urgent for all of us. Uh, part of what you are proposing with Amal is a way of dealing with this issue through an idea of welcome. Can you talk a little bit about what, uh, what you're thinking and what you're trying to accomplish that way? Um, I, I think that in the base of this project is thinking of the refugees not as an issue, as a misery, but actually thinking about the great potential they come with, um, their cultural diversity, their riches, their different rhythms. Um, and once you think about the potential they bring, welcome becomes a very important word because obviously nobody's born a refugee. It's a political choice to keep somebody a refugee. Um, and keeping that definition as short as possible and rehabilitating life, not the person, but his life, as quickly as possible is key, because then they can live to, through to their full potential. Um, and welcome is an unfashionable world. It's a word that is kind of uncomfortable in today's very hectic. But that's what good cities do, I think, sitting with all of, um, all of the people that run cities across the world that are innovators in cities. Good cities are welcoming. Um, and when you offer welcome, you offer a very, very easy way in to fit into a society, to become an active member, to become somebody who contributes. Um. I think one of the earlier sessions on workforce today uh, talked about how cities would do well to separate the notion of skills and experience from academic degrees and that there is so much talent and problem solving that doesn't necessarily come from elite education. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you've seen in refugee communities around that ability? I'm, I'm a Palestinian, so I grew up in Palestine. Um, talent knows, doesn't know borders. It doesn't know geography. Talent is talent. And skillfulness and the ability to think is not limited to geography. What I know for a fact growing up in Palestine and being in many refugee camps is we tend to think that intelligence is our ability to solve problems, which is right. That's what we do best as mankind. That's what you do best as leaders. Um, some of the best problem solvers on planet Earth live in refugee camps. They don't go to the MITs. They're not in the Ivy Leagues. They solve problems every day, complicated, crucial problems, uh, sophisticated problems on a daily basis. We have a lot to learn from them. In, in this ever-changing world that is obviously because of climate change, but because of the global Fragility we all have, and we just, we're just recovering from um, a global pandemic, and that proves how fragile we are. I think there's a lot to learn from that ability to, to outsource problems, to solve problems uh, in a way that isn't academic, but is on the ground and is created by solidarity between groups and by working together. Um, it's one of the most arresting things that in a places that are war struck or um, the ability of people to work together in order to solve acute, complicated problems is mind blowing. And I think Western affluent societies will have to learn from these abilities. That's a better reason to welcome them in. They are resilient. Um, they are they're, they're vulnerable, but in their vulnerability, there's a lot of resilience. There's pride there. We need to harness this pride and for, for the future of our societies. Again, pandemic proved it very well when everything was shutting down. The people that kept the engines of our societies running were immigrant and refugee background 
um, they delivered the food, they kept the supermarkets working, they kept the hospital working, they kept all the crucial uh, services running. Um, In many ways, the walk is organized to create those opportunities for community organizations to work with each other. This is, after all, a work of art, and every one of her appearances is a performance. But can you talk about how it is that you are trying to create social cohesion within cities through this particular project? It's, it's, a, it's an act of theater. What we do, we're storytellers. That's the only thing we can do. Um, we're trying to tell a story. What, what we started doing from the beginning, from when we were planning the first very long walk and then we did a visit to, to Ukraine and we just finished three weeks of five boroughs in New York, which was very interesting. Um, That's a thank you letter word. That was so interesting. N no, no, it was interesting <laughs> and challenging and beautiful. Um, th the premise is very simple. We, we talk with fellow artists in the city, with civic society, with schools, with the city leaders that are very important for the success of this project, with different communities within the city, and we offer a very simple proposition. Uh, there's a 10-year-old girl. She's alone. She's lost in this world. She has nobody. Um, what would you want to do to welcome her, to, to make her safe, to make her... And what would you want to learn from her as well? And there was unbelievable creativity and unbelievable generosity. Uh, in the first walk, we worked with 200 and almost 300 partners, uh, cultural institutions, civic society, you know, the whole range of a city. It is about local knowledge. It is about Amal comes to your city and she is celebrated by the city, but she's also celebrating the city. Um, the, the best example is when you have guests at home, when you're inviting guests, you tidy up, right? You put all the, in my case, the laundry under the sofa, um, <laughs> the children somewhere else. <laughs> um, in a way, that's what happens when a city tries to welcome a out. It's in its best behavior, which is glorious, because then different communities meet. Sometimes, we, I keep on saying this, and my producers don't like the word, but it's true. We're an excuse. We're an excuse to get people together thinking differently, challenging a narrative or an instinct that they never really thought of. Um, and when people are together consuming a story, a new community is created, and this is a welcoming community, and it's, it's very interesting, and we were surprised by it, because uh, as vain as we are as artists, we didn't think that will happen. Um, there was an unbelievable sense of welcome and a very emotional reaction to her in the streets. And, and we created a uh, corridor of friends across Europe in the first walk. Um, and it is very surprising to see the effect of her on people, but it's actually people meeting together in a place where they are kind. Um, is very beautiful to see. And, and of course, she's a refugee, she's an other. Um, and there's something very powerful seeing this 10-year-old child collect a community around her and, bec and become an excuse for a celebration, for a moment of hope. Just, uh, to, just to dig a little deeper on that and the way that, as an art project, this, this does that function so effectively. The mayor of Amsterdam earlier today talked about trying to lead from values, but refugee issues can be a third rail for mayors in, in terms of the, the local and often national politics, but you've described Amal as a, a kind of empathy machine. Can you talk about what you as a director have tried to do with how she presents herself and what that makes people do in response to her? I, I, I was given an unbelievable machine by, by an, uh, probably one of the best puppetry companies in the world, Handspring from South Africa, the creators of War Horse. Um, she is very, she's an amazing, amazing girl, um, animated by some of the world's best puppeteers. What we try to create is a complicated creature, a real creature. You, you see in the videos, she breathes, she has thoughts. 
the idea was to create a thought process. So when you look at her, you see her thinking, and because she's a puppet and because she's silent, you are immediately asked to translate her thoughts by yourself. And the minute you do that, you have created empathy. You're thinking for her. You're thinking for a refugee. You see yourself as one. Um, and, and that tool was very efficient because immediately people start translating what she is going through, what she's thinking of. Um, and sometimes it's their translation. Um, but it's always valid because this is the exercise. And if you can reach your kind of out, give your empathy to a puppet, um, the big challenge is then give it to a real person. He could be your neighbor, he could be a homeless person sleeping on your route to work, and it could be a refugee community that needs you right now. Um, but this act of empathy, again, a very unfashionable wor word in today's world, this act of empathy is crucial for our survival. I'll say it as bluntly as that. It is crucial for our survival as a species to be empathetic towards each other. We're herd animals. We're good when we're together. Not to offend many of the jobs that many of us do here, but what you're talking about is so much more effective than a press release or a photo op or an op-ed because it, it, it hooks into people's desire for story in such a profound way. But people get nervous often when artists get involved in politics. So can you talk about your own sense of what politics should be as opposed to politics being right or wrong? I, I, you know, again, being a Palestinian theater maker, I think all art is political. If it's not, it's irrelevant and it's so self-indulgent almost. Art is in a political act. Um, and if you're not doing it because you care about the world, don't do it. It's about communicating something to your fellow um, brethren, sisterin, <laughs> to your fellow men and women. Um, this is what art is. Political art is, for me, it's about expanding the definitions. If politics, and I'm, I'm not talking about local city politics, that's much more complicated, but national politics has the tendency to kind of reduce the message to right and wrong, they are good, they are bad, we are right, they are wrong, you know, this kind of tribal instinct. I think art, which is poetry, is about uh, expanding the definitions, um, asking questions, not giving answers. I think Amal is, is very effective because she's not saying, this is the way you need to behave. She's going, can you? Would you? She's asking a question. She's putting a propos pr proposition. I hate that word. Um, she's putting a question in front of us. And I think good art does that. Uh, and good art does that on a political level because that's where art matters. Um, if I was a cobbler, I would be making shoes for people who need them. Um, I'm a storyteller, so that's my limited capacity in trying to tell a story that will touch people. Um, but if it's not about the world, I don't understand why, why do it or, or why interact with it. So I understand that you have very generously made it possible for us to join that story. And there is a very special guest who is waiting out front for all of us. Um, since this conference is about cities, I would encourage all of you to come experience Amsterdam in the company of an extraordinary 10-year-old. And because this is a Bloomberg Philanthropies event, I can assure you there'll be amazing umbrellas for you <laughs> if you're at all worried about the weather. So if you would uh, come join us, we'll meet you out front. Yeah.